I remember there was a moment, you know, that I think it was about one, one, six, seven, eight months in when I think back then I think I lost about five thousand ringgit in total. Okay, and I'm for I mean it doesn't sound that much, right? But for right. a guy for your portfolio size, ma. But even then, for a guy who used to think about whether or not I should add egg to economy rice, mm. and yeah, then man, yeah, choose yeah. not to add egg to economy <laughs> rice. <laughs> uh, How many eggs are five thousand ringgit, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's about fifteen thousand eggs at least. You know, like that, that's a lot of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the thing was, I remember that back then I was just crazy. I couldn't stop looking at the at the at the at, the, the at my phone, yeah. the ticker, and. I, 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 I'm so unwilling to add egg to my top fund, but I'm so willing to stop by the side of the road and then go and buy top glove. In, in the <laughs> or, or try and sell Texang while I'm on the way back. You know, it's like, I literally stop at the side of the road and I do that. Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.firl.co slash f r E E or www.firo.co slash free. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Firo podcast. This episode is going to be an intense one because <laughs> we will be talking about a lot of individual stocks, not just in Malaysia, but overseas as well. But before we go there, I just want to introduce our guest, right? He's a former auditor at BDO ASEAN and Plus Highway, you know, the thing that annoys you every time you drive on the road, Every right? time you hear the tit tit. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> if you use the smart tag. Right? Yeah. Currently, he is the founder of uh, Troivo Capital, which is also a blog where he shares a lot of his thoughts, what he thinks of certain stocks, what he thinks of general investing trends. And he also runs uh, a fund, right? Uh, called Troivo Capital as well. Uh, Generated 87% returns in 2020 alone in comparison to the benchmark, which is FBM Amas Index, which only grew 4% in 2020. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Choi. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, just so I don't get in trouble with Securities Commission. Okay, okay. I do not have a license to run a fund. So that fund is just for family only. Yeah, family yeah. only. Family only and close associates. Some yeah. very, very, very close friends, but... Again, like no license, so don't come and ask me if I can manage your this, money for this you. This is private money, lah. Put it this way, lah. Private yeah, money. It's just mainly my own. All right. So, like every podcast, I think we begin with how do you start getting interested into investing and specifically the kind of style of investing that you are having today. So, uh, my mom, she used to buy stocks when I was much younger. I mm. think even today she still does. I okay. think she, she, I think her buying and basically speculating in stocks is one of the reasons our family didn't do too badly. Okay. Uh, ah. Yeah, because her stock holdings actually helped us put a lot of deposits for our houses and stuff. Ah. Okay. But um, so but, but since I was young, you know, there was always like annual reports always lying around in my house. Oh. So I always, you know, occasionally when I was young, I used to just pick them up and then just flip through them and then just was like, wow, what are all these numbers? Okay. And then I guess, you know, my dad was like, you know, we should probably try and think about it more seriously. And so they bought a book of Benjamin Graham's. Ah. Wow. The Intelligent Investor, which both of them have never read. <laughs> they just kept it in the shelf. <laughs> Grew but, spider webs. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was literally completely untouched until I think when I was around 10 or 10 year old. I, I, I used to read a lot and I still do. Uh, and then I saw that book and I just took it down and I just started flipping it. Okay. I was quite young then. So a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff, like especially when it goes into detailed balance sheets and income statements, it just flew past my head. Yeah. All right. But the things that really made sense for me was like when he talked about margin of safety mm. or like, uh, how or like what's the value of an investment, etc. The concepts are the key concepts. Yeah. So when he spoke about that, it really resonated with me. So, but that was the the and and then I read that and then a little bit of Buffett letters. That was back then. Mm. So and also back then, 
we only had internet since I was like form four, or form five. Uh, mm. Yeah, so there wasn't really the option of like going online to find. So this was before form four, form five, lah. Yeah, say. that was I think when I was standard five. Uh. Mm. Oh my god! Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, so I didn't have much books, I, and then I think the second book that I bought was like the Snowball. Ah. Yeah, by the the Alice Schroeder. Alice Schroeder, yeah. yeah. And then there was also this. My uncle had a lot of investing books by like Robert Kiyosaki or this little guy. So so mm. I also read those, but that was how I I thought about it. But in terms of investment itself, I never really bought a stock until 2016. So it's 20, about five years ago. Ah, that's interesting. 2016 or late 2015 like that. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of like what I think about investments, you know, I think the, there's only one way to think about investments. I mean, people can, I mean, no matter how we think about it, there's, there's really only one way, which is the value of an investment is all future cash flows discount, discounted back to present value. Mm. And then if it, it, it is an investment to you, if you buy it at a slight discount to what, to a, at a discount to what you think the fair value is, right. or, or if you buy it at a fair value, expecting it to grow a lot more in the future. Right. Mm. So that is, that's that. So for me, that's my investment philosophy these days, yeah. uh, mainly related to that. Although unlike previously, Previously, I never did any trades or any cyclical kind of things. But mm. these days, especially in Malaysian markets, I do that a little bit. I see. Yep. Right. So before before we talk about a little bit more about your style, right, I want to just ask you, right? Why is it that when you were introduced to intelligent investing at the age of like 11, 12, not even high school yet, but then it took you only until 2015 before you bought your first stock? I think I'd be interested yeah, to know that. I think I, that's an interesting question. Um, so obviously when I first read that, that book, it actually blew my mind. I, I read it again and again every single year mm. along with Lee Kuan Yew. But the reason why it only took me only 2016 to buy my first stock, actually that was not exactly the first day I bought my first stock. The first day I bought my first stock was in like when I was standard six. I mm. see. I bought, uh, what's that Robert Koch company that the, the one that had the scandal, the fright company. May, uh, Transmile, is it? Yes, Transmile. Uh, that uh, was literally the first stock I bought. Oh, wow. I, I, and the thing was, I only bought it with like, I only had like, back then, you know, everybody's young, so I only had like maybe 1,000 ringgit. Right. So I took 1,000 ringgit and bought Transmile with it. And then, Hall Holland. In. Uh. Hall. No, not Holland actually. I bought it and then after it went up and then I tell my mom to sell it for some reason. Oh. I don't even know what's the price I bought it and what I sold it for. Yeah, uh. But basically, that we, I lost money on transaction costs. Uh. Okay. But the reason why I only started to do investing in 2016 was because before 2016, I didn't have much capital. I right. see. Okay. So when I first started working, uh, the day I started working itself, I had maybe like 1,000 ringgit in my bank account. Mm. Mm. Because when I was in college, I, I didn't exactly save money back then. Mm. All right. Okay. But so when I first started working, I had maybe less than 1,000 ringgit in my account. And then... Uh, I started working for BDO. Uh, mm. BDO they gave me a scholarship mm. to study ICAW. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So after you study about six papers, they tell you to go and work for them. While you study for the remaining six, uh, the remaining three papers. So you study twelve first, and after that you you go and work for them while you study for the remaining three. Mm. But obviously, because when they gave me the scholarship, I I wasn't like for most charter accountants there. They have like a degree already. Mm. I was completely like just basically zero papers because the, the ICW is not done. Yeah. So they use that as an excuse to pay me a low salary. Like. Okay. Uh, yeah. So like my net salary when I first started working in 2016 was 2,000 ringgit flat. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So that was how I started. And then the 2,000 ringgit, you know, I mean, if the thing was that back then I had basically zero knowledge in terms of invest. I thought I had a lot of knowledge in terms of investing, but it's actually zero. Mm. So uh, I thought to myself, how can I flip this 2000 bring it up as much as possible so back then the and the reason was that when i was under this scholarship you know the moment i started working i realized like and and it's uh, oftentimes it's not that the job is bad it's more like because you realize you don't have a choice ah. right right and you're bonded then that makes it a lot worse how long was the bond i think the bond was about five years okay yeah mm. so you, so at that time, I just started to to think to myself, oh my gosh, I'm in this horrible situation. I might I, I remember there was a few times I thought to myself, should I just jump or something? But mm. just being ridiculous like back then. Okay. So uh, I thought to myself, okay, I need to get myself out of this situation. So I need to save up as much money as possible so mm -hmm. that in the event I'm going to tell them, you know, I want to leave, I can just do so instantly. I understand. So... Back then, my thinking was I need to turn this, I need to take, make this thing go up, but I can't do it in stocks because I cannot take the risk of it dropping. Understand. It needs to only go up. 
So back then, I used to be very into audio equipment. Mm. You guys might not believe me from me fiddling with this thing and not being able to put it on just now. <laughs> but I used to be very into audio equipment. Into audio equipment, And the thing about audio equipment is that for things like this, the market is in US dollars. Mm. Yes, because audio equipment, basically when you buy, sell online, it's all in US dollars. So back then, I think it was 2014 and 2014 was a wonderful year for US dollar items. So the thing is that when I negotiate and I buy this stuff from people, I'll be like, well, you bought it for 5,000 ringgit in Malaysia. Yeah. So I'm buying it from you for 3.5. That's your receipt. Yeah. But I know I can sell it for 4.5 overseas due to the Forex. But I these see. people, they don't really know that. Yeah. I see. It's an yeah. arbitrage. Yeah. arbitrage yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Forex arbitrage. So I, I did that. And then, you know, it. and to be honest, I'm... And yeah, so at that time when I was saving up to do this kind of stuff, I was living on around 50 ringgit a month. <laughs> to be fair, I was living my parents. So okay. some people can't do that. But to be very fair, I think you can find a hostel and live it in there for like less than 300 a month if mm, you really yep, want to. Yep, yep. Mm. So, so and also there's some food costs, etc. But back then also, I, I occasion sometimes there was dinner at home. But most of the time, because I, I'm an auditor, so I work really late. Yeah. My dinner will basically be just roti canai with just a lot of dal. Because yeah. that's where I get my... Your my, 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 you know, my nutrients, dishes, bulk, my right? nutrients <laughs> and then I'll take a lot of curry ayam and then, because there's technically some protein in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was what I did for, I think I did that for around two years. Wow. Yeah, I, and then I, I remember there was one, there was a few things that really struck, stuck on my mind because I had a pair of shoes and the thing, I remember that at one point it was starting to break down, but I just refused to change it. Okay. So for around two weeks, it just started getting breaking down worse and worse until at one point it broke down so bad that I had to use cello I had to find like a black tape and just tape my oh, shoes up yeah. and then after I walk back and then when I was walking the train station the it started to rain like crazy <laughs> and so I, I was like that was the day I sh I changed my shoes uh, <laughs> that way. but yeah so. But the thing was, I there's literally no way I can have the level of capital that I had, which was I think in about less in about one year plus, I had about fifty k. Mm, nice. Okay? So there was literally no way for me to do that if I did not save like that. Because like the very first deal that I did, I still remember it very clearly, is a razor blade fifteen inch. Okay, this guy got it from uh, Lucky Draw. Okay. Okay. Back then, razor blades, if you buy new, is like maybe six thousand five at uh, least. Okay. Yeah. Uh, six thousand five to seven thousand ringgit. The guy was selling it at four point five k. There was an arbitrage opportunity. Yeah, my account at four thousand five hundred and three and thirty ringgit something cent. Okay. So I went there and then I took out all my money and I bought it straight away. And I knew that if I could not buy it from him then, then somebody would have taken it away because it's so cheap. I see. So I bought it for four point five k. I opened it up and just tap tap a bit, just feel this happiness and then just set it off. I remember the first time I brought it back, my dad looked at me like I was insane. He was like <laughs> so disappointed. It's like I, I I brought you up so long and you're just spending all your money on this. And then when I started selling it, and then he's he realized how cheap I was. Now my parents are constantly telling me, Can you just spend a bit more money? Like, can you buy a new car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and then I also did my audio equipment in in audio, the audio world is a very kind of interesting world. There's a lot of earphones that sell for like 15,000 ringgit. Yeah. Headphones that sell for 20,000 ringgit, all this kind of stuff. And I basically buy from one country, sell to the other. Quite common is that I will buy it in Malaysia and then sell in Singapore, etc. And oftentimes you can obviously, obviously arbitrage by just taking a Malaysian listing and then listing it in Singapore. And when somebody wants to buy it, mm. you make sure it covers your cost. You take a deposit, then you just sit the bus and you go over there. Oh, you, you personally deliver it rather than courier it? Depends on the value of the item. Like some of the items, like for example, there's this thing that I bought called a DCS Debussy. Okay. A DCS Debussy back then was around 30,000 ringgit. Okay. Wow. So again, it was my entire savings. There's no way in hell I'm letting them take it there. <laughs> no, so, how to cover insurance. Or is yeah. Insurance is self-insured. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but, but there's a lot of good things that come out of it. Obviously, it's that one year savings. But the second one is that, like for example, I didn't change my old, my old Proton for a long time. Like the hood actually had rust on it. Okay. Um, and the thing about it is that number one, when the police stop you and you go and put on a pitiful face, they will actually believe you. Wow. <laughs> no, you have to imagine if you're driving a Honda City or Mercedes like A30 or, or I don't know what is it called, A30 or A, A, A45. A20, A20, A45 or whatever. A200, yeah. Yeah, A200. There is no way on in in there's no way on earth that they are going <laughs> to let you off. Okay. There was this police, he was like, uh, you know, he tried and what? Then Obviously, most people will give 50. I say, bang, lima uh, ringgit boleh. <laughs> the guy was looking at me like, kut, kut. And, I like, <laughs> <laughs> he, that, and then the second part that's really nice is that when somebody hits you, you can act like a rich man. Tapu, tapu. Pugi, pugi, I don't care. Uh, 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 because uh. the car is really just like... A junk already. 
I mean, it's not junk. It yeah. can still work. It works fantastically. Yeah. But you can buy it for five thousand ringgit, lah. Mm. So, right. so yeah, and to an extent, I, I do quite agree with what Yi Feng used to say, lah. Like, there is actually no excuse to not being able to save money. Right. Precisely. Yeah. So, like, I remember I was back. I remember when I first had my first fifty plus k, whatever. Back then, I still wasn't willing to eat MACD mm. because MACD is stupidly expensive, or drink Starbucks unless it's with. Right. Unless it's with people who I want to talk to, because mm. then it's not me buying Starbucks, it's me buying the time of us talking. Correct, together. correct. Yeah. So that time, I I remember I was at past I was at a petrol station. Then I see these two this couple on a on a on a motorbike, and then they went and bought a Costa coffee. I could see like they clearly didn't have money, but they spent like fifteen ringgit on the Costa coffee, and I was like thinking to myself, "There's just no excuse." Like, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that that's a bit of my background. So only around twenty sixteen, that was I remember clearly was when I had. My first, I think I, I I can't remember maybe fifty, maybe sixty, seventy, mm. and then back then a lot. Of, I still remember this moment quite clearly because all my, all the money I had was in sing dollar and mm. it was in ten thousand dollar notes or one thousand dollar notes. Mm. Mm. And that experience you have when you take that to the money changer to change it, mm. and the share and your and your fear as you have a backpack of like. Fifty thousand, sixty thousand ringgit <laughs> in some way, and you're thinking, how the hell am I supposed to deposit this? Because it's across the road. You need to actually get out of the place. <laughs> I remember me and my parents back then. We were all like holding the bag. Oh, your parents were accompanying you, lah. I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure if there are many friends I can trust to just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I had friends that I could trust, but then they, they weren't around now, obviously. I, I and, right. and 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 I didn't want people to know about this kind of I yeah. mean, it's, it's stupid stuff that you're doing. Like. Yeah. For some reason, they couldn't transfer the money for me. So. Oh man. Yeah, so I still remember I did that, and then I started to invest. Yeah. Now I thought I was a very smart guy, you know. I've read all this value investing, you know, da, da, da. and then, yeah. uh, to be fair, my first investment was fairly decent. I bought Air Asia at ninety cents. Mm. Nice. Do not ask. the The only reason I bought it was that I know who Tony Fernandez is. I know what he did. I looked at the accounts, and then I figured, you know, yes, there's a sh- there's a lot of that, mm. but. Uh, it's probably not going to go down because a lot of this is just cash flow. So whatever, yeah. let's just do it. And then I sold it off at around maybe like one hundred fifty or something like that. Right. Okay. But I didn't put that much in because I wasn't, I, I wasn't that sure. But I, I put a decent amount in. Yeah. But the thing was that that was where the good story stopped. Mm. After that, for the next I think one year plus, I still remember my sec one of my major second investments. It was Gamuda We. Mm. Mm. Today Gamuda We is zero. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get out before zero? Yeah, I remember I bought it at one ringgit thirty five cents. And the thing here was the thing that was so interesting to me. I looked at that company and then I thought to myself, you know what? There's no way on earth I think Gamuda is worth. Back then it was like maybe four ringgit fifty cent or almost five ringgit back then. Okay. I thought myself, there's no way this company is really worth five ringgit because I know if I go, there are so many better options in my opinion. Yeah. But then back then there was a guy, very popular. Even today is still very popular. And mm-hmm. He and it was his. Uh, it was his call. It was his his universe, lah. <laughs> okay. I think I think you know what I mean, lah. Mm-hmm. So it was a very big call. So now the thing is that that guy and me had completely different investment and trading philosophy. So you so if I make a loss, I can't exactly blame him because I did not, for example, buy a subscription and then follow his philosophy. I followed my own. I understand. So I'm buying it for the wrong reason, my own. But the thing was that back then my thought process was this guy. I look at his returns. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> okay. I was like. I, this thing might, I don't think it's worth this, but you know what? This guy looks like a genius. I mean, he looks like a, a, a Malaysian Warren Buffett or what, or, or George Soros. Then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it. And I bought it at 1 ringgit 35, 1 ringgit 35, and then I was like holding it. And after it dropped below 1, thir- it dropped to 130. I thought to myself, you know, I I it, I, I think I think can support, you know, because the back that I used to trust these supporting lines or whatever, <laughs> then I hunt <laughs> more. And then after that, it dropped below that, I think the one ring it 25, one ring it 20, and then I just cut. And then also, I also followed Gadang from back oh, then. Oh, Gadang, it was, yeah. It's the cool and all these kind of things. And then I also did some really, I remember there was one more, I'm not sure if you know, it's a plastic and solar manufacturer in Malaysia, quite small. Texing, is it? Texing, correct. Yeah, Penang, yeah. We, 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 I've covered it before, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I and lost tech, money on that before. <laughs> Texing was also one of my big losses because Texing, I remember I was saying, you know what, I don't think the solar losses will be that, f- that, will be that bad. Okay. And I think the, that was the quarter, that I was predicting the quarter before I made a loss. And I thought to myself, you know what, Malaysian market, the, if they think the profit is going to be up slightly, they'll probably just hold it anyway. Yeah. Uh, turns out market is not that foolish even in Malaysia. La. So, mm. so yeah, I predicted right, but then everything else was wrong. So 
I remember there was a moment, you know, that I think it was about one, one, six, seven, eight months in when I think back then, I think I lost about 5,000 ringgit in total. Okay. And I'm for, I mean, it doesn't sound that much. Right. But for, right. A guy, for your portfolio size, ma. But even then, for a guy who used to think about whether or not I should add egg to economy rice, mm. and yeah, then man. Yeah, choose yeah. not to add egg to economy <laughs> rice. <laughs> uh, How many eggs are 5,000 ringgit, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that is about 15,000 eggs at least, you know. Like, yeah. that, that's a lot of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the thing was, I remember that back then I was just crazy. I couldn't stop looking at the, at the, at the, at the, the at my phone, yeah. the ticker. And, I, 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 I'm so unwilling to add egg to my top fund, but I'm so willing to stop by the side of the road and then go and buy top glove <laughs> in, in the morning. <laughs> Or, or try and sell texting while I'm on the way back. You know, it's like I literally stop at the side road and I do that. <laughs> then the the moment for me that I felt something was really wrong, uh, when I was number one, I was down five thousand ringgit in just loss, and then three thousand ringgit in 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 transaction fees. What? I was like, Wait, what? Yeah, I had fifty k, and within eight eight months, I had like a five hundred k turnover. I was like, wow, that was. How well, much you were trading. trading you were yeah. trading ten times your portfolio value. Yeah, wow. and I mean. It, that it was a turn or, turn, turnover, like, turnover for that, right, for that right. period. Mm. So I remember I was telling a friend, you know what? Uh, I think the problem now is that uh, I, it's because I don't have margin, you know. If I <laughs> oh, margin uh, and I average down, uh, I sure can go and get the lower price and then go and win one. Yeah. Then back then I used to do also a lot of stuff. Like, you know, you find the, the big droppers the day before and then you buy and then try and make the, the little edge when it pops maybe in the next day. Yeah. Or like, you know, dividend, it drop a bit more than it should, etc. Yeah. So I remember at that moment, I thought to myself, John, you must be insane something is wrong yeah. then after that, I, I at that moment i finally something just snapped in me now i was like you know what i think i actually don't know anything that i'm supposed to do like i think i have the top process but i didn't think i actually knew what, what i needed to do mm. so i thought to myself you know what I, I actually stopped trading completely okay i went cold turkey i literally stopped everything completely and then i sat down and I thought to myself okay i need to understand how to invest mm. so how do i do that so the first step that i thought to myself was uh, who do us? Mm. Well, Warren Buffett. And this time I had internet. So I went and searched Warren Buffett and then I downloaded everything possible from him. So he had transcripts of his AGM mm -hmm. and his AGM are four hour each. So there's about, in total, the transcripts was around, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, around 15,000 pages. Mm. And then plus his annual letters from 1956 right. yeah. till today. That was even his partnership letters, everything. Yeah. Then after that, I also all of his books and then uh and then I also downloaded a few more like Charlie Munger daily journals all the way from mm. as early as I can get. And then I downloaded Steph Clarman again as much as I can get. Ooh, Sorry. Oops. Okay. Yeah. No worries. And then another one was Scion Capital, Michael Burry, also yeah, as Michael much Burry. as I can get. And then Oak Tree Capital. Uh, Howard Marks. Howard Marks. Yeah. So basically I just started to read through some of them and then whoever they recommend, I just download everything possible that they wrote and then I just started reading. This was circa 20... This was started around 20... Late Se 2017. Okay. That's when you started your fund already, right? Late 2017 was... Late 2017 was when I... I mean, I technically started running my own fund at 2016. I have a friend who was extremely good and... For some reason, he trusted me. Not for some reason. I mean, he trusted me as a person, but he also knew that I was giving him FD rate plus I will guarantee the principal. Uh, so that was your hurdle in a way. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, so that was the, the, the my thinking. Manner. So after that, I just started to read and then I can tell you there's nothing more pleasurable. I mean, the thing is that, the, the thing is that people don't realize that you actually it's, I mean, not that you don't need to, for some people, if you don't have the time and then you need someone to that, to congest it down for you and give it to you, uh, it's probably better if you go to some course or something. Yeah. Right. But for me, if you're actually planning to really invest, there is no other, there's no better way than to just go through everything that let's say Warren Buffett said, because the, the guy has, the, the, the thing that's really unique about this guy, I mean, he might have some slight ethical, I mean, not that ethical, it's just like, you know, just, he doesn't say what he doesn't need to say. Let's just put it mm, that way. Yeah, yeah. Like for example, when he was younger, he used to do a lot of trading, a lot of like arbitrage stuff. Now he doesn't do it. Mm. When he was younger, he used to talk about his stocks a lot. Now he doesn't do it. But that's very clear because now he has hundreds of billions and yeah. he has, and he has no point for him to talk his stock because if he wants to, he wants to buy the whole company, you see. Yeah. And, you know, and he cannot do anything but long-term investing because, you know, what, what arbitrage are you going to do with, with, with 150 billion in cash? Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So that was, so, the thing about Warren Buffett was that he is so sincere. That's, where else are you going to find a billionaire sit there for three to four hours and then just answer every single every question sin, yeah. you can possibly have? 
It's crazy. Yeah, and there's like 20 years worth of questions. So that's Correct. easily 100 hours. So this is like, you have to pay him around five to 10 million to have a dinner with him. Lunch. In, <laughs> to have lunch. Yeah. Lunch with him. And that's just like one or two hours. Correct. But here you have 100 hours and it's free. Like, like, like what question? Like even now, I actually don't know if I if there's even a point for me to buy lunch for him. Yeah. Other than, other than because I want to help his charity because whatever he's going to say, I already know. Yeah. Like, if, like literally whenever I... I I, I look at a stock and straight away in my brain is so it's so wired to straight away WWBF. What will Warren Buffett do? <laughs> well, WWBD, sorry. Yeah. So uh that was so I, I basically read everything about it. Then after that I thought to myself, okay, so what does Warren Buffett say about studying stock? Mm. Uh he says read A to Z. Mm. So I went and take a look at the KLSE A to Z. Mm. In hindsight, I wish I wish I wasn't looking at KLSE A to Z. I wish I went and look at US A to Z. Right. S&P A to Z. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I mean, it would be a better use of my time. But back then, my thinking was that, oh, the Malaysian market is doing so bad. So there's probably more opportunities here. Right. And there is, but Malaysian market is the more historically overvalued due to EPF factors, all this, which yes. I never really considered back then. I yeah. just always thought, why is all these stocks so expensive? Like, yeah. So expensive. So... Instead, I went and buy the cheap ones. And in Malaysian market, there's in terms of really wonderful companies, there's a few. Yes. But, um, and and you te- you can technically just fully invest in Malaysian market. It's not that much of an issue. Mm. But the US markets have a lot. Number one, in terms of US markets, if your brain is right and you get your future direction right, uh, your your stock will actually go up naturally because a lot of very smart people are also looking at everything and then the the and everybody is and so if you're right you're right you see but in Malaysia if you're right it can actually not go up for a long time unless obviously when the earnings come in and even when the earnings come in it mean it mean yeah, not actually yeah. good now in in it's actually a good thing like for mm. example my RCE capital when I first started buying it was like one ringgit thirty cent yeah and the earnings kept going up but the stock price just kept not moving yeah stagnant yeah. But I was like, you know, I know these people, I know the company, you know, I would just keep buying. But the problem was that I only had like less than 100K or just slightly above 100. Like mm. you can buy, yes, but you know, it's- you Does, know, it, you does it really pri- make a dent? Uh, you know? Yeah, it, it, you're, you can't privatize it. Mm. So there's some, it's, it's not so much opportunity cost because you're looking at it as a business, but it's more of like, compounding will take a lot, lo- a lot longer. Mm. Let me put it that way. That way. So, uh, I started looking into the Malaysian markets and then the first stock I remember I, I found back then was Timecom. Mm. Right. <laughs> I found Timecom at, back then if I'm not mistaken, it was around 30 times earnings. Eight bucks, I think, that time. Yeah, so it's probably eight, eight, nine eight, nine ringgit that yeah, time. That right. was, I think, 2017, 2018. Right. That started, time, Afzal was already in the CEO yeah, position. Yeah, Afzal was in for quite some time. Then mm. around nine ringgit, I bought it. It was 30 times earnings. I remember I was thinking to myself, John, you must be insane by the time come. <laughs> it's 30 times earnings. Mm-hmm. But for about a week, I just constantly thought about it. I thought to myself, you know what? There's no company in Bursa right now where I'm absolutely certain that they're going to grow earnings at 20, 25 to 30% per year mm. like that. Yeah. Just like that right. every yeah. quarter. Right. Yeah. Because there is nobody that offers better value service at all. They're, they're cheapest and the most and the best value. Yep. So I thought to myself, you know what, I'll buy it. And then I bought a nine ringgit. And then in 2020, it was nine ringgit, but the PE now went down to around 20 times. Uh, That's right. About 18, 19, 19 times. So, you know, uh, and it was quite good for me like, because it was also one of the reasons why in 2020, I was able to sell it and then buy other stuff that's cheaper because that thing actually didn't drop. Mm. Yep. So... My style back then when I first started reading these annual reports all that initially was, you know, okay, let's do the Graham style. Yeah, you know, let's net, look net, for NET <laughs> Well, Bursa is full of net nets. Yeah. Net net to till you won't believe it. Uh, yeah. Net net until wow. <laughs> below below book value, <laughs> Not, before ca- below ca- You can I my my thesis back then was like, okay, fine, I need to wait, I need to do discounting, whatever, tra, tra. So I would look for let's say property development companies that are selling at like less than 30% of RNAV. Mm. I mean, one of my companies that I liked back then was Di- Diamond. Diamond. Okay. I, mm. Yeah, Diamond, I remember I did the RNAV. I saw their gigantic golf course in Johor that is not making money, but the land is worth easily a billion plus. Yeah. Then let's look at the RNAV. I was like, this is about a $15, $16 company. And then they privatize it at four ringgit eighty cents. <laughs> I mean a little bit, but I was expecting you to privatize it a lot better than that. So, but... For some reason, that never really kicked in my head that you know you should stop doing this. Um, it was only after, but I, 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 I had most of my portfolios in companies that I think will grow earnings and give out dividends, like let's say Timecom, RCE Capital, mm. and these kind of companies. But I still had a lot, about twenty percent in all these companies that were technically 
actually lost me money, like, to be mm, frank. Mm. Even though back then my thinking was like, well, if you have a very long term view, you know, why not? But then the question is that let's say if it's MK land, mm. let's say for example, what I I never really thought about it in terms of probabilities, which mm. is like what is the probability that this company is going to actually give you the fair value of this of whatever they invested right. in? What the odds are? Yeah, let's say within the next one year, three year, five year, ten years, twenty years. Now the thing was that if I thought about that for, for Diamond, there is zero, literally almost less than five percent probability that they will give you fair value for the next five, 10, 20 years. There's mm. there's just no way on earth. Mm. Okay. And then, you know, so so that only was that was only something that surprisingly was only something that was kicked into my head properly around March mm. 2020. Mm. Ah, okay. Last year. Yeah. And that was from two reasons. One was that I started playing poker. Ah. Poker is all about probability. So you you always think about what your what your odds, etc. And then when I was looking at less, then I remember at that point, I still remember so clearly, MK Land dropped to around five cents. Mm. I had a little bit of MK Land. And I looked at that stock and I was like, that stock is less than 10% of the book. Mm. And I know your land That's is worth, crazy, man. Is worth mm. something. I, uh, now I was thinking to myself, but why on earth I don't feel like buying more of that? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I back then I was quite lucky. I wasn't, I, I wasn't leveraged. I had some cash and then I, I had a lot of credit lines. I was saying, why on earth am I, do I not, I mean, now it's, I think, 15, 17 cents or whatever, so it's mm. a lot higher. But the, the 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 key process that really smacked into my head then was, like, why do I not feel like buying them at all? Like mm. KSL, all this. Oh, KSL, right now, yeah. Yeah, KSL, Planitude, all this. I was like, why, why don't I feel like buying them at all? Like, I used to think of Planitude, for example, and OSK as pretty good deals because the land was great. The management is okay, nothing fantastic, but they were paying out dividends at least. So, so you know what? But then I was thinking, why don't I feel like buying this? Why do I feel like just going to US now and just hentam Google, hentam Facebook, yeah, hentam yeah. all of this? So at the moment, then I thought about it in terms of probabilities. Let's say you're you're buying this stock for let's say thirty percent of book of RNAV. You're basically saying that you think there's a thirty percent chance the company is going to give you fair, a fair value kind of valuation in the next three, five, ten years, whatever. And then I think to myself, is I don't even think there's thirty percent. Then I look at the MK land and I was like. I actually don't think there's even a 10% chance because even some of the other big but minority owners are selling their own stock. Like, what, what, yeah. why, why are you doing that? You see? So clearly these people are, are stuck. Like, unless, yeah. So that was the moment that it snapped for me. And then after that, I just refused to buy any more net nets. Mm. Okay. It makes sense to buy net nets if you can privatize a company, which mm. is something like, for example, I think maybe I'm wrong, but E and O boss, I think Dato T, mm-hmm. right? Dato T is trying to do now with Ian, not Ian, oh sorry, Kajaya Prospect boss. Oh, Kajaya Prospect, yeah. Yeah, he's the one, he, I think he bought, I think Ian a long time ago and now he's like, you know what, I've been stuck for a long time. I don't, I, I don't know what he's saying. Okay, I don't know what his, thing, his thought process is, but I think his thought process is, I've been in here for a long time. I think I want to just privatize this company mm. because he bought at almost two ringgit per share. Right. Yeah, now it's about 60 cents. So, yeah, so that was a moment when my thought process shifted to either one, you find a company with a very strong catalyst. That means these are mainly going to be trades or short mid-term investments, depending on how you look at it. Or you find a really long compound mm, right. that you can really invest in. Because a, lo- a lot of times you have to think about your opportunity cost and in terms of like what 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 you have around you that's in comparison to, 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 to whatever you're, correct, you're, correct. you're looking at. Yeah, actually I've got two follow-up questions based on yep. your elaboration. It is very related to the Malaysian market. Mm. First is with regards to um, the work that you need to put in to read. I mean, thank you for sharing and, and I think it's very key for our listeners. Do you think an average retail investor will have the motivation, dedication and actually discipline to go through that kind of reading? Now, here's an interesting question. Uh, about, sorry, about one year ago, I started no, one year ago, about a few months ago, six months ago, I started my, my I in March 2020, I told my dad, you need to refine, you need to either refinance or sell one of the houses and give me the money and buy stocks mm, now. Mm, mm. It took about until December for the thing to finalize. Okay. Yeah. But what? But it's too late. But never mind. But I remember in December or I think it was January when the money came in. Then my dad was like, "Okay, I'll give, let you manage it, whatever." But I would also like you, if possible, could you talk to your to your remiser and then maybe open an account for me to do it on my own. Mm. Okay, then I asked him why. Why would you want to do that on your own? Mm. Again, in in so he was like, well, you know, I just want to invest on my own. Then I say, why don't you try and be a doctor on your own just for fun? You know, <laughs> why don't you try and be a lawyer just for fun? You know, I said the the thing about this is that I I told him the thing is that 
investing, I don't know if people agree with me, but investing for me is actually a full-time job. Now oh, you can choose is. to, because it, it really is like, I, I tell him, look, that there's people like me. And then if you go to US markets, there's a lot of people much smarter and much richer and much more savvy than me. Yeah. And in the short to mid term, it's all going to be, you know, uh, zero sum game. In the short to mid term, it's a zero sum game. And if let's say you come to Malaysia markets, there's going to be a lot of people telling you stock to buy and their story is going to sound very convincing. And if you're not savvy about it or you know how to think about this sort of things, you'll be like, oh, okay, this sounds like a pretty good idea. But how do you know what, how it is compa- in comparison to every single idea you have around around you? Mm. Yeah. You don't have much idea. So for you, that's a good idea. For me, that's a horrible idea. Mm. And number two, like, are you sure you really understand the business? Like I told my dad, dad, you need to remember, you bought Sapura Kanchana at four ringgit. <laughs> I, he Ooh. didn't buy much, but I told him you bought Sap- Sapura Kanchana at four ringgit. Now you have to go think back on your process. Back then, yeah, I remember you wanted to read the annual reports. Why did you buy that? Yeah. So I was, I to be fair, I bought it at one ringgit and then I realized I was an idiot and I sold it the next day. Mm. But yeah, so after after discussing with my dad, he's like, okay, I agree. Now, for most people, I think the thought process is this. If you want to do an investment, let's say, you want right. to invest and you're not willing to sit down and read annual reports like crazy, okay, uh, you can do the Peter Lynch way. Mm. But the thing about the Peter Lynch way even then is that this person needs to be very conscious about how businesses are done. Mm. You see? Yes. So the 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 thing, the, the way I would say is that one thing that is slightly useful is that investment in general is the study of life. Mm. I'm not sure if people agree with me mm. on this. Yeah. Mm. Because if you want to be a good investor, you need to understand life deeply. That means you need to understand human nature. You need to understand physics, science. You need to understand, you know, history, the economy of the world. How, let's say, China grew up, how went up, went down, went up again. How each industry evolves. Yeah. What's, uh, what are all these dynamics? And then you can have a good context in terms of your investment, where it is. And then right. you need to do your research. So I said, you can go and do the Peter Lynch way, which is you go and if you have an idea that just, it just stuck in your head and then it just bugs you and you just can't stop thinking about that idea and you just can't help keep asking people questions about this and then do your own digging because it just yep. stuck in your head. It just gnaws at you. La. Yeah, then yeah, maybe you should consider investing in that. Yeah. But even then, you know, you really need to, to, to have the thought process of at least like Munger makes it very clear, inverting it. Mm. That means find out how you will screw up because if as long as you don't screw up, you should do pretty okay in your yeah. investment. If if it knows that you like that and you yeah. just can't find a, and you just can't find a, a a a weak spot in it or a major weak spot in it, it'll probably be a good idea. Yeah. So you know, like let's say, like for me, I was like I said, I, I was a fool because I didn't look at US markets because mm. even back then, like Google all this, I didn't bother to go and study them, even though my brain is like much much better studying for long term <laughs> versus short term funds. <laughs> yeah. So you know, Google is such a simple business to understand. It's yes. like it's it's. You, you don't need to be a genius. And even at today's prices, it's like, you know, you won't go bad in your life if you just have yeah. thumbs on Facebook, Alibaba, Google, yeah. and just yeah. Amazon or whatever. Yeah. If, I mean, so, it's slightly so, expensive, yeah. but you it's know, so predominant. I yeah. mean, it depends on the time frame, lah, right? If it's a two, three year time frame, maybe it's expensive. But yeah. it's 20, 30. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I always think like, you know, if let's say you are, uh, it, it really makes sense to follow that Warren Buffett 20 year kind of, you only buy a stock, you only have 20 choices and you and you have to buy like as a private company. I, yeah. I really agree with that. Yeah. Because when, because I think a lot of like all the net nets that I used to do is because I think they were pieces of paper. Mm. And even now in Malaysian context, there are a lot of companies that I'm buying basically because as a trade. I mean, to it's an extent, trade, huh? I still look at it as a little bit like pieces of paper because they are trades. Mm. But I think this style of trades, um, unless you're willing to spend, in Malaysia market is still possible because the general, I'm probably going to unintentionally insult a lot of people, but <laughs> I, the good thing is that most people think that they're above average. So <laughs> in general, the bar in Malaysia is lower. Let Low, it, let's just say lower. <laughs> let's just say lower. And it's not their fault because yeah. in general, there's not much incentives for really, really brilliant people to be investing in Malaysia because there's not that much to I mean, there are, there are a few really great ones, but there's not that much too. So, um, so in that in that sense, you can still have an edge because if you have an understanding of how how of of businesses and, and stuff, you you still have an edge. But obviously, the edge is getting less, especially since March twenty twenty, when all these retailers. retailers come. But again, it could obviously be another you know boom, etc. But it it will all end in pain in the end like, because yeah. you know, the pipe pipers will pay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so um. If I were to say, if someone wants to invest, I would say 
you either choose that to to really know how, you you invest in what you know. It's essentially invest in what you yeah, know. It doesn't have yeah. to be stocks. Yeah. Right. If you know a company or you know an industry so well, and then you you're just using this product all the time, like even LVMH, like are you there's there's no you, you can you can consider correct, that actually. Correct. It yeah. is not that bad of an idea. Yeah. So yeah, I would say invest in what you know. There is if you're if you don't plan to study investing like it's a job. Uh, only buy the ideas that really know at you and then that you're really sure of. <coughs> and then you you really think of yourself as a really minority shareholder. Mm, mm. You have to think of yourself, you have no power at all. So whatever money you give this person, they are, they are going to be able to do whatever they want. They can screw you left, right, yeah, center. Yeah. 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 Look at it from that context and then you have to think about it, like really think about it as a permanent kind of thing. Mm. Like if given all those scenarios, i.e. you have no power, you have, you have to buy it permanently, and you cannot sell it forever. Uh, you think in terms of that context, and then you you decide whether or not you want to buy or not. I understand. I understand. If you if you have those filters in your mind, I think easily ninety nine percent of stocks you literally won't touch. Correct. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. And it's and it depends because that's because you're willing you're not willing to put in the extra effort to find the the additional you know five or ten percent stocks that can be done whether it's a trade or short term or mid term or maybe one two three years. Mm. So because you're only looking for the twenty. But even then, it's like I can I've known so many people who you know. Bought Inari when they were young. Mm. Oh, <laughs> bought Hata Lega when they were young. <laughs> okay, bought Vitrox. There's at least one person I know, uh, who bought like less like about one million ringgit in Hata Lega when they first listed, and <laughs> then he just held it. And today you can see him in the list, lah. Yeah, chat bela already, lah. Yeah. So the thing is that, and you have to understand, uh, like you be like, oh, but then I, I forever cannot find this out, this out stock, so. You think you want to be hot until hit lottery so easy? Is it? <laughs> it, it, you, you. The, the thing is that you need to be at first at least aware first. Yeah. And then you just constantly think about what are the businesses that are amazing in my mind. Yeah. And then I really want to buy. And then you know you. And then when you find one, you buy because and it's not going to be easy to find because these type of things if you find and you hold it that long, you really cover all your bases. You will never be poor when you get old. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But you better make sure that it's that it's really that company. Mm, mm, so mm. yeah, that that that's how I. So that would be my advice. Uh, if somebody wants to study, right. yeah. wants to not okay. study, wants to at least invest in something, and it can be even your friend's business, yeah. or even like you know some property or whatever. Like or even like back thing. when I did the the audio equipment. Like, I mean, if if you understand, you know, Rolex watches are, are really. Good. Oh yeah, I used to do watches. Uh, I used to have a, a Rolex Batman. I used to 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 trade a few. But you still have it, uh? No, I bought for like I, I remember that it was selling for thirty four k in general back then. Mm. I bought for twenty nine because the guy was desperate and okay. then I had cash, and then I sold it off again after that for like thirty one, thirty two. I always try and buy way below so I can sell below market price still. But today I think it's like fifty k. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So actually, if you really love watches and you really understand watches, why not just mm. study watches? Actually, I was I was asking because I want to buy it off you. Maybe maybe after this podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So no, I, no, no, for collectors. I, I have one more question, yeah. though, MJ. With regards to privatization mm. and, you know, the, the part where he mentioned he bought NetNets and right, then right, there right. was a possibility. Do you see from your experience, <coughs> right, a lot of privatization exercise actually does not benefit the minority investor? A privatization exercise in general, unless it is an MNC type in the US, yeah. will, never ben- will, man- will never benefit the minority shareholder. Mm. Because... If I'm the majority shareholder, why would I want to do that? Yeah. Now, if you look at it from the perspective of majority shareholder in Malaysia, the their perspective is mainly like, uh, oh, why do I want why not I just pay myself a big salary? This is exactly cash, ma. And I, it's not like I want to sell my shares anyway, so my share price go up, why do I care? Mm. That's their perspective. But that's usually the perspective of people who are in really bad businesses in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay? that's true. Yeah. Because for me, the real money uh, that comes from being in the private market or even like long term is when you have a really good business and you manage it well. Like being honest and sincere is really extremely lucrative, mm. but you just have to be a bit more patient. Mm. So the thing is that most people don't realize it. So like, for example, Hata Lega, like right now, I mean, not right now, like even back then or even QL, let's say today is like 60, 70 PE. Yeah. Do you think if people don't trust the boss, QL will be 60, 70 PE? Oh. There's oh. no way on earth. Like there's no way. And then Malaysia, obviously, because there is the EPF mandate, which is basically you have to buy, the, the fund managers have to buy local stocks. Yeah, yeah. Really good companies in Malaysia always trade extremely expensively. Now, whether or not you you think this is a good investment kind of thing, it's it's up to you. For me, I'm not too keen because what if EPF change their mind one day? Mm. Yeah. 
But like the just to show you a context, like back before, let's say, if you look at the stock prices before, let's say, 2000 or 2005, mm. Nestle Malaysia is way cheaper than Nestle Europe, for example. Yes. yes. But yes. today is opposite. And yeah. if you want to look like just like the most obvious one, Pentamaster Correct. Malaysia. Yep. Hong Kong. Hong yeah. Kong. <laughs> yeah. All their earnings come from their 63% holding in Pentamaster International Limited in Hong Kong. Mm. So all of their earnings come from there. So, but in Malaysia, it's selling for like 60p. Well, in Hong Kong, it's selling for like 11p. Mm. So you have to give yourself some context in terms of that. Like. Yeah. So at least for me in... As, an, as a long-term investor, if you're looking for long-term, long, long-term stocks, I think in Malaysia, your options are not that as rich. Right, yeah. And I think obviously China is a way better option in, in general. Yeah, yeah. Because China, you have a lot of great things happening in there. In, in, they have a lot of great market dynamics now that will be very good in terms of tailwind for the future. Understood. Right. The reason why I ask is because a lot of retail investors in Malaysia, the moment they see privatization, right? They go oh gaga, you know. They go mm. oh yeah, I bought this, and then the most likely if it's private, it's going to be at this price. And yeah, I, I I want to dispel that myth that privatization actually it's it's a double edged sword. Like actually, it's more de- detrimental to the retail investor. Actually, it really depends. I suppose, like you know, in at, at the end of the day, let's say FGV the privatization privatization at let's say one thirty one forty go through. Sure, it's great if you bought it at like seventy cents. Yeah, but it listed at four. <laughs> So mm-hmm. it really depends on when it is. There's a lot about these arbitrage opportunities that you can find in in Malaysia. Mm. Uh, that you can work on. Although, like, I think that the other day you guys had you R- Rondi, 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 yeah. yeah. He was saying that there was a 5% spread, etc. Yeah. He said he couldn't believe that this would happen in Malaysian markets. I would say that to an extent, Malaysian market is not so efficient, mm. but it's also because privatizations do not always benefit you. And like, for example, MAA I bought, mm. there was about 6, 7% spread. Ah. Uh-huh. The privatization failed, uh, and then I lost about six, I guess six percent or so because it just dropped instantly. Because a lot of this privatization, one one example I can think of is COVID. Yeah, COVID. You know, oh yeah, man. Yeah, and and you know that uh, we had we had common friends. They literally were super angry at the at the yeah, banging table, uh, banging oh, table, yeah, this kind of thing. But in a way, when you look at it, it's the share market. <laughs> it's yeah. a free market, uh, So you yeah, can't, yeah, yeah. So, in general, it will never be fair to you unless in like this US context where they're actually buying it for the business, mm. not because they want to buy land cheap. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. All yeah. right. So sorry to interrupt this podcast. I know it's a little bit annoying, but I want to tell you something that I think can be really helpful to you. I can tell you're really interested in the stock market and want to learn more about it so that you actually know what you're doing, especially when today things are getting more complex and complicated. That's why we came up with the Stock Investing Blueprint or SIB. It's our signature e-learning program that teaches you how to pick the right stocks most of the time, buy and sell it at the best possible time and manage your stock portfolio systematically. It currently has more than 10 hours of content and it's growing. you also be part of a group of like-minded investors that can help speed up your learning process. To hop on the program, click on the link in the description or go to learn.viral.co slash courses slash SIB. Okay, uh, I think, right, th- this was the record, right, for mm. the number of questions we've asked so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite good. Yeah, yeah, we it's asked one good. question. And it's yeah, very good. <laughs> la. Thank you so much. I think I, I, my nickname is to be Lawsaw. Yeah, yeah. 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 Don't, don't try Lawsaw. Yeah, yeah, don't try Lawsaw. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so... I, I have a few more questions and I think we're going to start moving into the juicy section yep. of the podcast, right? Which is actually uh, talking about stocks. But before that, I want to get your thoughts on... and uh, on. Okay, first of all, right now, personally, right? What is your allocation geographically? Mm. And what do you think of diversification? Because the, the, the one interesting thing you brought up was Peter Lynch. And pe- whenever people talk about Peter Lynch, right, it's always how simple he explains investing to be by what you own and all that. But people don't talk a lot about the way he diversifies yeah, into a lot portfolio. of stocks. Mm. Because I feel that 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 is also crucial, right? Because that that means right, he just needs to spend very little time on the Correct. stock and he Correct. just buys it and then he just waits and then we'll see, right? He, he can wait for six to seven years because it doesn't matter. So in, in in from your point of view, uh, what do you think of diversification? And of course, what is your geographical diversification right now? Okay, um, this is gonna sound like the craziest fun in the world. Okay. Okay. Uh, pre COVID, I was hundred percent Malaysia. I okay. plan to make it thirty percent US. Okay. And then. When COVID happened, I went about 70% foreign markets and 30% Malaysia. Okay. Right, right. And then in 
in August last year, I went 100% Malaysia again because I had a really good idea in LC Titan. Okay. And then now it's about going back to 40-50% foreign. I see. So All for right. me, it is not so much what's your allocation by industry. Um, it is in terms of what opportunities do you have at hand mm. in terms of, I mean, obviously, if you have an opportunity in Malaysia, you should, that is better than the one in the US, you should do so. In hindsight, I'm not sure if the US if the US opportunities is worse than the Malaysian one because US went on a, a complete tear later after yes, that. Yes, exactly. So so maybe we should so so and back then also my my thinking was a lot more on like you know because I I knew the Malaysian kind of the way to really profit in Malaysia mm. which is basically cyclical mm. because um, Malaysia market is one of those markets that will definitely overvalue your cyclical commodities. I see. So. Um, so back then, my so so that was how I allocated it back then. Now, in terms of diversification, the way that I would look at it is well, the, here's a very interesting question that I asked myself as well, and I asked Warren Buffett. But the thing is that if you ask a lot of different value investors, everybody have different opinions on it, and they're That's all right. very valid. Yes, one hundred percent very valid. Agreed. Yes. So back when I was in my old days, uh, it was used to be like you know I would buy my really wonderful companies, maybe thirty percent, twenty five percent, almost forty percent weight. But then like all my little puns like MK land 1% or Daman 1% or Planitude 1% no? mm. because these I these I'm like, you know, you need to hold it for very long term, blah, blah, blah. So then only you will realize. Um, but I would say that diversification is if you want super normal returns, you have to be very concentrated. But again, if you're very concentrated, you better make sure you know what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So um so for example, let's say the LC Titan one, when I first saw it, it was so clear to me that I went 100% all in. But mm. you have to know, I am I have a very clear understanding of the risk reward because yeah. it's at the bottom of, 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 of the worst recession possible. That time was, I think, net cash. Uh, Selling for less yeah, than net, net cash. cash. That's yeah. crazy. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then spreads were opening up, et cetera. Yeah. And then I just think to myself, because I, I you always want to think about it in terms of, like, like people always ask, what, how, how do you determine what amount to put into each stock? Mm. There's only one answer. It's called a Kelly Criterion. Yes, Kelly yes. Criterion, yeah. Now, so what is Kelly Criterion? Kelly Criterion is basically something that people used to do in gambling. So mm. let's say when you're playing blackjack, Kelly Criterion will help you make the maximum while minimizing your probability of ruin. Yes. Okay. So now, the thing about Kelly Criterion is that you it requires you to know very clearly what is your age mm. and what's your probability. Now in stocks, obviously you're not so clear what's your age and what's your probability. So yeah. it's not so clear. But let's say when I was going to LC Titan, back then my age was at number one, I knew this information before other people, not before other people, but before most people. Yeah. And then unlike previously, well, I opened up my mind since Warren Buffett was willing to talk about Geico when he was young, I'll be willing to talk about my stocks now. Yeah. So yeah. that would, so obviously info, as information spreads, um, as you disseminate, your own notes and your own information, people can make their own decisions. And because I think the idea is good, you know, most people will probably, right? why not? It's a good idea. And it was unloved because when it listed, it was about what? Eight, four. Four. Eight, 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 eight. I remember it was yes. eight because I remember it was, it was so famous that a lot of the listing advisors, the listing uh, undertakers, uh, underwriters themselves, they had to support the price on IPO. Yeah. Day. Yeah. It was, it was quite, it's quite famous. Uh, that, that, I mean, yeah. Whoever, who, I mean, whoever who bought the, the cornerstone, I, I don't know what to say. To you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, no, I don't say much more, you know. Yeah. Praise, praise in vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah, so the thing was that if you think about it in terms of credit criteria, my thinking was that, well, I have at least, I think about 70% chance it's going to go up at least 10, 20 to 30% in the next one, two, three months mm -hmm. as the results come out. And yeah. as, because even now I know the retail market, there's a lot of very smart people keeping track of all these different commodities items. But yeah. I looked at the stock, it was completely un un not moving. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, is there any reason for people to sell? I mean, if a refinery explodes, yes. then yeah, that, that might be a reason to sell. So I thought, what's my probability of that? Okay, I'll just put 1%. Mm. And then there's about 19% chance that it will go up. There's about 10% chance it will go up maybe 50% or more. And there's another 5% chance that say that it will go down 10%. Mm. So given those odds, how much should you put into that? Uh, I did my credit criterion. They said hundred percent plus, or Damn. more than that. So obviously, I'm I wasn't utterly insane, you know. So I I, I leveraged up a little bit for it, maybe about ten percent. Mm. But it but that was mainly because I was the I I couldn't get my 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 margin out in time. Mm. But 
Kelly Criterion actually said I think it was two hundred to three hundred percent. I should put it in now. Wow. So like, wow. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not insane. Okay. <laughs> I, I do not. I do not want that one percent chance to actually happen to me because I play a lot of poker and one percent actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that one out that they have yeah. it actually happens. You see. So I thought to myself, you know, what? I'm willing to go maybe one hundred and fifty percent or one hundred and seventy percent because I I was very clear. But then I was so so, um. But but that was back then. But Back then, everything was all-time low, you see. So your your risk is a lot lower. Like now, if you say at this price, at Oxy Titan 270, well, you know, the the the, the risk of it dropping is not 5%. Yeah, yes. it's, yeah. it's it's maybe 30%. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, there's a lot of... Because when when as, as prices go up, your margin of safety in terms of how much you have to be right becomes a lot smaller, Correct. you see. Like it's so common, like, you know, people say... Supermax is gonna hit one billion profit. Yeah, I hit one billion profit and drop the next day because <laughs> yeah. everybody knows, you see. Yes. So, so it's like you need. So you always need to keep track of those things. So, um, yeah. So that is. So that's my view on diversification. So it's. So for me, is that if you don't really know the company, let's say you 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 like Google, you really understand it, but you don't really know it. How do I mean by you really know it? You. Warren Buffett, for him to really know Coca-Cola, he read the annual report since it was listed in yeah. like 1800. Correct. So if you want to tell me you really know Google, why not you read the end? Because the owners are still the same ones. Yes, They're still yes, running it. Yes, yes. I suggest if you just think, oh, I use Google Maps, I use Google Search, all these things look very good. I think I buy. If you're buying on that basis, maybe you put 10. Yeah. But if you are willing to go up to IPO and then before that even, and then read every single book about them and yeah. then study it from top to bottom, do up your models and make sure you understand every component properly until you have 90, 95% confidence level that you are one of the top 1% experts on Google in the world, I suggest you keep it at 1%. Yeah. But let's say you understand it to that level, then maybe you can even put 100% in, it's not Correct. an issue. Correct. You know? that, that's when you back the truck. La. Yeah. But not before that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, it depends on, on how well you know it. But if you want like super outperformance, you need to be very focused. Oh, yeah. It's possible to buy like 20, 30 stocks that, that all do very well. But the probability of you being able to study 20, 30 stocks since IPO, etc. Well, unless you are a full-time investor, yeah. I don't think it's so possible. Yeah, even full-time uh, investors is not going to be so Even easy. full-time right. investors, you look at no, the analysts, they still cover certain sectors only. Even yeah, yeah. then, it's quite broad-based also, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know. And even then, like, let's say for me, I, 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 I let's say if, if you ask me to study Google, I, I mean, I can get up to like 80% confidence within a week. Mm. But if you say up to 99% where you want me to put 100% in, well, you know. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind putting 100% in for short term, but... Okay. For a long term, you know, I, I, I yeah, you, you, you're gonna read at least for two months straight. Yeah, yeah, man. Can I, I think can, like uh, Kathy Wood. I think oh, she's. Yeah. I think Ark. They're doing like twenty. I think almost thirty stocks. I believe. But she runs the ETF. Uh, yeah, so true. it's a little bit different. Uh. Yeah, uh, maybe just just uh, put in a devil's advocate. Uh, in mm. a way, the way we are talking and the way we are sounding, right? It sounds that the gap to be a very good investor to the guy who is starting out is just so big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get what I mean? So, would you still encourage, instead of people going to buy ETFs or unit trusts or whatever other instruments they can give them, where do you think is the bare minimum level for a retail investor to actually get started? I think the bare minimum for a retail investor is to just sign up for FURL and just sit there and talk to you all. Thank you no, so much. No, because honestly, like, let's say you're a retail investor and let's say, how much savings do you really have? Like, until you have your, your first 100K, and I don't mean ringgit, uh, yeah. uh, how much money you make per year is actually not that much. Mm. Okay? So, if you think about, in that context, so let's say you have 100K ringgit and you don't plan to put your heart and your soul into this right. thing. Uh, what? Let's say you make 5%, you know, that's 5K, it's like, you know, what, what can you do with 5K? Like, <laughs> wouldn't it make more sense for you if you just increase your own income levels? Yes. Yes. So, let's say I, I, I do have, like, some friends, they're doctors, they they just tell me, John, you know what? Why don't you just write your research and you give it to me? I don't have the time to go and study all these like tens of thousands coming, but they really enjoy investing. Mm. So, so, so that's that's their perspective. So let's say if you're saying for someone, you know what? Why that there's a, such a big gap to being a, to being from a newbie to an investor. Da, da, da. But like I said, investing is a study of life. Yes. Okay. I always have this confidence that like, like good businessmen are generally going to be fairly decent investors mm. if they have the right mindset because. Business is really a study of life also. Like business people, you're always like constantly like challenging yourself, doing new things. 
obviously if you're like an employee ish kind of person and you do the same thing every day and you don't try and strive to 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 to, to improve yourself improve yourself but to be fair if you play a lot of genshin impact or like you know igg or, or like mm. what or, or like you know a lot of games maybe you can find out which company runs those games and yeah. study them you know it's not it's not an issue but um i would say the gap is but for me the study of life is like a is like a bad is like a requirement for most people mm. you can you can kind of again i might sound really arrogant you can kind of tell just from talking to someone who has been like let's say especially because these days i talk to a lot of 50 60 year old people mm. who have been you know just employees and working the same job for the last 20 30 years and who is let's say business people or people who have a lot of their own interests yeah you can just sense completely is a different kind of that most people they, they they stop learning at the age of like 22 yeah it's not, sad, not their fault it's not their fault because some people they they grew up in and we have to be conscious uh, aware of this some people they grew up in really tough situations like for yeah. example my parents when they first started working you really can't do much but think of working because number one you know my, my i had my own family the the grandparents correct, there, you know, they are dead etc yeah hospital stuff that was long 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 time ago yeah so sit sit and read what annual report or read, read, book, <laughs> read, read your book uh. i need to work uh. <laughs> i need to put food on the table yeah, yeah. I, so i was very lucky to not have to worry about that so yeah. i can do that so but I would say that it's the study of life is a is is a requirement if you have the time and you have the and you have the luxury of being able to do so because completely agree. Yeah, and I always think to myself, you know, like let's say you're a fifty year old uncle, uh, and you want to be a investor, it's actually easier for you to be a good investor than it is for me when I was young because yeah. you have so much life experience. Yes, all you need is just a right framework of mind. Correct. Yeah. So if let's say you want to be an investor, let's say okay, I would think that actually you can really understand it in just like. Two, three books. Mm. Two, three books. Like you just sit down and you read those two, three books or better. And honestly speaking for me, why not just sit down and read? Okay, maybe you don't read the annual reports because the annual reports are not the easiest thing to read for Correct. Berkshire. Yes. Okay? But why not read the transcripts? The transcripts in total is about 5,000 pages. Now mm. you think it's very difficult to read, but really it's not. It's, so it's fun very to fun. Read. Yeah. Yeah. Why not just take one transcript? One transcript is around, I think about 50 to 100 pages. Mm. Okay. Every month you just read one. Mm. Okay. It's, it's going to be so easy for you to read. And even if you just read, like, don't read all the transcripts, you just read, like, three transcripts, chances are your brain is going to just be, like, you know how to think already. Yes. Like, for me, investing is very simple. Like, in terms of, like, financially for, for life, uh, assuming that you're coming off from a decent base, uh, mm. as long as you don't screw up, uh, you should do pretty well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like, as long as you don't screw up, you should do pretty well. So, let's say you read five transcripts and then your brain is somehow good enough that you are now able to understand some companies. Mm. And then you think, I use a lot of Facebook. Why not I study Facebook a bit? Yeah. Just, I mean, maybe you'll be like, I can't read. I, I don't have the time to read all the way. But maybe how about you just read like, you know, three three years? Let's three say. years. Just even the, the management discussion analysis or prospects of the company, yeah. right? If you can even understand that. Not the struggle is this. Uh, when you mention about the uncle and the 50-year-olds, uh, and I, I just wanted to share a story. I, I, I think it's for me, pretty important. Uh, I was teaching this concept. If a business costs you two bucks, mm. right, and it can make you one buck yeah. every year, yeah. will you sell the business to me for two bucks? Yeah. You, this, this, you own this company, you put two bucks in, every mm. year give you one buck. Mm. Will you sell, if you are the owner of the company, will you sell it to me for two bucks? Probably not. Probably not. Right? You should, the answer should be no, right? But even that simple concept, right? I realize a lot of people don't have that kind of framework. Or exactly, which is why for most people, actually yeah. you should forget about stocks, inv yeah. invest in private companies in yeah. Malaysia. <laughs> like private companies in Malaysia in general sell for book or less. Yeah, yeah. And there are some companies, like I know there are some industries, there's one business I'm actually planning to start. Yeah. The ROE is 300%. Wow. <laughs> okay, but this type of business, if you want to buy a private one, I bet you can buy for one times your earning. Okay. Uh, so, be, be, uh, side talk later. <laughs> <laughs> side talk later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, now, so you talked a little bit about LC Titan just now. I think we can revisit a little bit about it later. Yeah. But now we're gonna talk about s certain stocks, right? Yeah. And I think this will be the longest podcast. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, so yeah. far today. Be prepared. <laughs> Law saw. Law saw. So, yes. No, no, no. It's, so, it's fine. <laughs> it's so a conversation. Now let's talk a bit about my news now. Now yeah. uh, let me just give everyone listening some context. So my news is in the news because <laughs> of uh, CU, Next the month. Korean, uh, the Korean, uh, what is touted to be the Korean rival for the likes of Family Mart, yeah. uh, the likes of 7-Eleven and things like that. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, I think they want to open like 50 stores within two years. So that is uh, a very aggressive right growth story right now for my news. And mm. I know that in your blog, you are quite positive about it, right? So now, uh, of course, before we begin, do declare. Do you do you own a stock? Do you not? Yeah, own I still stock? own some. Okay, great. So now, explain to us, uh, you know, uh, in in your own words, right? What is the case for my news? All right. So when I first started studying my news, it was around fifty seven cents. Now, mm. I know this company it listed at I don't know what's the adjusted for bonus price, etc. But it listed at something like one ringgit fifty. I mean one ringgit fifty or something adjusted for bonus or that kind of stuff. Mm, mm. No, sorry, it listed at sixty cents adjusted for bonus shares, etc. Mm. Um, then I know it reached a high about one ringgit thirty cents. Mm. Now, the thing about my news uh, is that in general, number one, I knew that the industry was right. Yeah. Okay. It's not a super amazing industry like. Like let's say Mr. DIY, where there's literally zero competitors. Mm. But it's a fairly decent industry that is going to grow very quickly. And the nature of convenience marts is that in general, they always obtain like very, 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 very good margins because convenience stores don't compete with each other on price even overseas. Mm. Yes. It's, because know, it's competing on convenience. Yeah, because nobody is going to not buy a, a bread if it's 20 cents more in this store when the next convenience store is. Unless they're, they're like you during your budget when yeah, you yeah, have to yeah. add an egg. <laughs> yeah. For me, I would never shop in convenience stores to make it to make it very clear. Like, oh gosh, don't, let's, don't, let's, not, let's not go into that. I used to buy 10 kilograms of stuff because it's on sale. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's insane. Let's not talk about that one. But yeah, so my news, so that was a context. So I knew it's a really good company. And then the second one that I knew was that now they are in some temporary trouble due to the FPCs, mm. the food processing centers. Now my news, they had this really big plan when they first IPO, they would be like, okay, we can't just sit there and, and try and use news to bring people in. Because every, this convenience store businesses, if you look at from the past till now, previously, you can rely on people be like, oh, okay, uh, just leave the what, right? Just just leave the the the, the supermarket, right? Walk into my news and read some magazines. Uh. Mm. Who reads magazines now even if it's yeah. free? It's mm. like, you know, unless it's the age line, you can make money from reading that magazine. Uh. But, you know, most of the time you'll just be reading your, your phone. You're just looking at your phone or whatever. So you actually need a reason for people to come in. Mm. So my news, they already saw this in 2016 and thought, you know what, we're going to do our own food. Yeah. However, Number one, there were a few problems. Number one, they were thinking we are going to do this ourselves because mm. we do not want, at least that's what I think. Yeah. That's because that's what they did. We're going to do this ourselves because we don't really want to, you know, have to pay all these like royalty fees, etc. Franchise fees. Franchise fees, etc. But the problem was that they never really had a really good food people in there. Mm. Mm. That's my perspective. At least the, the Japanese there were supposed to, to give them the direction, but I'm not sure if they really knew like what really sells. So, that resulted in the FPC losses, et cetera. But if I look at the company excluding these FPC losses, it's actually making more and more money every year. Mm. And this company has always been a fund darling. Mm. It used to be very hot among the funds. Mm. And that's because the management is actually pretty honest and sincere. Like, mm. like whenever I talk to, like when I try and find out about this guy, Mr. Dang, mm. I study his history. He, I study how he ran the company. He never tried, he, 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 based on what I read, he never really, everything is quite clean. Mm. Okay. And then I talk to people who, 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 who know him and they tell me this guy, the only thing he thinks about is just my news. He's very dedicated to this uh, business. Focused. Yes. So it's, and then, so, so I thought to myself, okay, let's, let's, let's see then. This is the, the underlying issue. Can this problem be solved? Can this FPC problem be solved? Now, if you told me, would I buy this stock if there wasn't a CU? Um, maybe because you know a lot of the losses come from the come from the 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 fact that it's MCO etc. And also because they they the FPC losses. But I I my thinking is that maybe I'll buy, but not so much because end of the day I know these guys are sincere, they're smart, they're gonna figure out a way to turn it around. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it can be as simple as basically hiring. I mean, that was their new what their new CEO came in to do. Yeah, uh, Madam Lau. Yeah, she came in and then they actually hired like people like really good food tasters, etc., to try and improve the products, etc. So it would have taken time, but more time. Mm. Okay. And then there's a second problem for me that I see is that there is mm. a branding issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's very simple. If you go to one KFC and then this KFC tells you, oh yeah, 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 but we don't have uh the the, the spicy version. Mm. For what? Some reason, we only have the original. Mm. Then you go to the other KFC, they have both, and then you see 
Texas chicken and they always have both. Like, why would you? So, so there, there's going to be some inconsistent experience, inconsistent branding. And this is my news legacy issues. Mm. Okay. So I figured, you know, they need a, a fresh slate. They need a, they need to either completely redo the, the brand, like at least come up with, like at least the stores, let's say that have the FPC items, you make it, you, you change it the name to like, let's say Maru Mart instead. Because like, instead of changing the name, they have like a little logo mm. where they say this is a Maru Cafe. Like, why not just change the whole thing to a Maru Mart and then people just know if they go into a Maru Mart, that's going to be this stuff to eat. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have taken more time. But then when I looked at the CU, the thing is that I I I, I know the QL bosses and the sons are, are fantastic, amazing yeah. mm-hmm. individuals. Dr. Chia, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. But the thing is that I don't think that, you know, Mr. Dung is like inferior. He's just started off the wrong foot. Like the Ms. Dr. Chia went straight and, and his son went straight and be like, let's take in Family Mart. Yeah. And we're going to do that. Yeah. And so that's what they did. And uh, obviously they also have a bigger <coughs> background in terms of like manufacturing foods, all that kind of stuff. So, so the vertical integration was easier for them. Yeah. 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 So um, my news didn't really have that. So they have, a, they, have a harder, they have a harder way to go about it. But then the CU, I thought to myself, you know what, this CU thing, I think it will really shift things because now they will actually have data on, you know, what is actually popular among mm, right, what type of people, right, mm, right, you know, mm. like, because these people actually have the experience of running a convenience store that's very focused on food. Yeah. So I thought to myself, you know what? And end of the day, this is my thesis was that I thought to myself, there's a 70% chance that when it opens, people will go mad over it. Yeah. Because I mean, it's Malaysians like to eat new stuff. It's like, as long as you you put a lot of marketing firepower behind it and the branding, etc., is good. People are just going to go there and try. Mm. And then, I thought to myself, the CU store, when it first opened, would definitely have queue. Mm. Yes. Okay. So, and I thought to myself, the food will definitely be way above whatever that we're eating, other than when compared to, to family, family mart. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because I looked at a lot of the CU mart reviews online and I thought to myself, well, this stuff that they're cooking, they, are, they look pretty good. Mm. Uh, some of them have pork, so obviously you can't bring in, but that's also <laughs> the limitation that family mart has. Yeah, so yeah, it's not, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. they are both on the on yeah. same food thing, you yeah. see. And then when I first ate the CU food, I was like, oh my god! What do you what do you buy? What do you buy? I bought everything. You buy oh. everything? <laughs> All the items. All yeah. the items. It's up. an investment. I, back, yeah. back then when I when I invest first invested in my news, I had 70, 80 percent in. Mm. And then it went up a lot. And then after when the CU opened, I was like, you know what? Why why you want to be a cheap skate, huh? Yeah, yeah. You already made that chunk. Why yeah. not you spend like 0.5% of that on here? Just to do research. Yeah. yeah. So I just bought everything in the store that maybe not everything, but all the food lah. All the food I've tried it. Okay. The packaged food, all the snacks, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm gaining a little bit of weight. <laughs> research. It's for research. Bro. Yeah, it's for research. I'm also planning to buy an iPhone for research, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, so uh, so I bought everything and I tried everything and then I thought to myself, number one, the ice cream is, for the first time in my life, the ice cream actually exceeded Family Mart. Mm. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay, okay, You're okay. convincing me to try it now, man. The ice cream, Family Mart have some really good stuff, but the ice cream, it actually, for some reason, it actually feels healthy. Uh, the taste is that, oh, it's wonderful. Bland. The taste is wonderful. Mm. Family Mart obviously still have the edge in like onigiri, I suppose, compared yeah. to my news. I don't know why my news onigiri is just not there. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but then, you know, but the main thing about, let's say, these convenience stores that I thought to myself that needs to work well is that their snacks, as in like their desserts must be good. Now, here's why I say so. If you eat a, a bento box from Family Mart or let's say from my news, to be frank, they are both not good. Okay. Okay. If you compare that price versus what you can get for the same price, unless it's Rishi Sanmai, mm. they're just not good. And to be frank, the taste is probably somewhat comparable to Kafal mm. wow. or, or Tesco. Because, but that's the nature of things. Because right. if you cook Frozen. something pre-cooked, then yeah. it's come there and then you 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 want to micro, like realistically, what can you expect? Yeah. You think of yeah. it like airline food lah. Yeah, and 15 ringgit, you know what? I can have a r- three plates of really good nasi lemak. You know, it's like... <laughs> yep, yep. So for me, the bento, all this kind of stuff, for me, that is actually the minor stuff. The main stuff that you need to get right and you must get right is your desserts. Mm. Yes. Because desserts, the taste do not change because they're meant to be frozen, you see? Yeah. So when I first started eating my news, des- my, my news desserts long one, two years ago, it's like... Oh. Yeah. But, not, but you go to Family Mart, it's not that good, but they have a lot of options and all of them tend to be pretty decent. decent yeah. Then when I went to the my news one, now I see they finally have some proper cream puffs. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, finally you have cream puffs. And then they have like, they are, they are, they are, they are soft. They are this like little like Sunday kind of like this. 
okay. strawberry stuff is, is actually I was like, wow, that's pretty decent. I actually okay. don't mind. Okay. It's five ringgit, so I probably won't buy too many of it over okay. time. But you know, it's it's fairly decent. Most people will. My yeah. my my spending patterns is very really different from people. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, got hope, got hope. And then I look at the I look at the, the Korean fried chicken. Um it's it's let's just it it's it's pretty good. Like if you compare it against uh, let's say uh Kyochon when you same spicy taste and then compare against this one. It's actually pretty, pretty comparable. Pretty okay, good. Wow. Yeah. But obviously, in my opinion, Kyochon is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say <laughs> Malaysia international food can never compare to foreign come over yeah. overseas. Uh. it's yeah. just a factor of you having of us having less money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah. So, so I was looking at it from that context, and I thought myself, you know what, C is going to do well. Now, before this, when I was speaking to the management, they have their own plans. They were like, oh, we're going to open some CU stores. We're going to open some my new stores, mm. etc. But end of the day, I know they're logical. Okay, I know f- since the day this this guy was this since the ga- the day this guy started running his business, Mister Dang, he has never had people queue outside his store before. I see. Even when my news first opened, right? I mean, would you queue outside of my my news even? I didn't even know ago? when it opened. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> suddenly they are in but, LRT station. Yeah, so but like. I'm sure like ten years ago, if you drop by LRT station, there's a my news, and for some reason there's a queue, you're not gonna be like, oh, let's join the queue, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's you know, in his life, it's never happened in his life before. I see the queue uh, from so long and then I know that they had to restock the store three times and then later at night one of my friends showed me a picture of Mr. Dung just standing in the middle of an empty store just like a bit shell shocked like. no, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like you know what I don't believe that you are not logical and you're not going to just go and hunt up all your stores to make it into CU now it maybe it might be very drastic for people to go you know what let's convert my news into CU now all yeah. of them yeah. that would be a very drastic move I don't know if it's the right move because I've never run a business for 20 years yes. he has yes and obviously, his his he his slight weakness, as if you can call it a weakness, is that he obviously have have some attachment to all of his current stuff, etc. So, so he may not move as fast as let's say uh the 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 QL son will move. But yeah, I know these people are very competent and they are very dedicated to the business. Yeah. Mm. So give them time. Yeah. And now they have time and they are actually solving the problems. It should do very well. Huh? Mm. And then when I first bought my news, um, I think at fifty seven cents it was like. 15 or 16 times normalized earnings. Mm. Now, you have to know in, in Malaysia, metal stamping companies can go to ATP. <laughs> yes. They think they're going to be good. Yes. <laughs> so, Actually, that, that counter, right, you know, when we, someone asked me that about that counter before, it was just listed, you know, and I mm. looked at it. I said, huh? They claim to be semicon by metal stamping. Yeah. And the next thing you know, <laughs> ATP. I was really scratching my head. You know which one, right, MJ? You know? I know, there's a lot of which one. Start with you. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you and N with C, right? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. It, it, you know, I want to get your thoughts on like, okay, so I think it's quite clear in terms of the qualitative picture that you're painting that you know, there's a lot of runway, right? There's mm. some tailwind behind. So what do you think that tailwind can translate into in terms of the sales that they're making right now? Have you made some sort of projections about what that might look like? Okay, so in terms of sales, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in general, normal convenience store make about 900 to 1 mil a, a, a store. Okay. Tops, 1 mil tops. A year, uh, right. depend, It depends on location or so. Yeah, right? depends on location, but on average, around 900 to 1 mil. Mm. Uh, QL, their family mart, because mm. they do all this convenience stuff, is actually nothing around, if I'm not mistaken, it should be around 3 million per store. Wow. wow. That's about 3x. Um, now, obviously, when I did a margin calculation for them, I, I did them, I post that, the Q, the the family mart one is obviously lower etc in terms of slightly lower but it's it's still about there my news is actually the most efficient mm. but the thing is that nine percent of three million versus nine percent of one million is still yeah yeah you rather have like let's say six seven percent of three million than nine percent of, of, course, of, of one course. million yes. and it's one store you see yeah so uh for me I don't see a pro a reason why they can't make the same level of sales as family mart right now they're clearly doing that I mean the queues is just as long as when family mart opened yeah. I think they should really improve that onigiri. I don't know why Family Mart one is so good because onigiri <laughs> is really like, I, I don't know, it's just like really convenient. Like people actually yeah, eat yeah, that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I'm very compelled to buy onigiri most of the time. Yeah, but the bento, you know, I mean, it's comparable to, to Family Mart. Family Mart is also not, not good. This one is also... So, it's, so it, it's frozen food. It's frozen food. Not much you can go. But the onigiri, like Family Mart, you can really get it right. Because I, I think the my news one, the onigiri, I don't know why the rice is a bit hard. Ah. I don't know why. Like, when you eat the Family Mart one, it's actually not that hard. It's actually fairly decent. So I see. 
I mean, if Mr. Dong, if you're listening, you need to figure <laughs> out this 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 thing. Hire a Japanese guy yeah. <laughs> to get it right. <laughs> I remember, yeah. So no, 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 no. I don't know who who to hire yeah. But I, I, yeah. So that that's one, and then um, the the second part, obviously, evaluation. Uh, if you think about it, so I think they can do obviously per store three million sales is not that big an issue if that if they focus on it. Mm. Now, if you think about valuation, uh, now if you look at QL, uh, it's about seventy times earnings. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the thing about QL. Now we can. I remember me and Philip used to argue yeah, on this. Old, like, I, like I, I saw those. Uh, yeah. Let's just say we legendary. We, legendary. It's, it's all online as well, right? Yeah. 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 He was. I I still think. QL is overvalued, but obviously with Q, with the family mart doing as well as they are, it might be undervalued mm. if you look at it from a 20 year co- context, for yeah, example. Yeah, and yeah, then the management yeah. is fantastic. Really, yeah. really fantastic management have a way of making overvalued stock become cheap. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um the thing about QL, let's say if you look at the business, uh, if you just study their 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 broiler and then their chicken business, uh, end of the day, it makes like 10% ROE or so, maybe a bit higher, mm. but it's been dropping since 20, 30 years ago. It's been dropping every single year. Yeah. And their growth in sales all that is not that much, to be honest. All right. Mm. Because also it's like the chicken business in Malaysia is one of those like, the whole place is run by Chinese and there's a reason why it's all run by Chinese. <laughs> this, you, uh, it's, it's a very difficult business. Actually, you know, uh, we were looking at MFLA and the chicken business is tough. I mean, every the the past two or three uh, Mfla uh, um, annual reports that we read, right? Every year he will keep on saying the broiler business is tough. The broiler business is tough. tough, unless you value add, meaning you do more processing onto the live chicken rather than yeah. just selling the live chicken. It's, it's it's tough. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so if you look at that context, uh, now, um, the I mean, I don't maybe. Whoever wants to know, I suppose Philip is on i3. You guys can somehow find out. Just search Philip and then somehow his name will pop up. Philip Farms. Philip Farms. Oh, enjoy his Telegram group as well. Yeah, yeah. his Telegram group. Yeah. But the way that I think about, let's say QL uh, is that it only makes sense to buy their business if you think that they are going to use whatever they have learned from, let's say, all this low margin business mm. to make sure that they execute their high margin business very, very well. Mm. And then, so basically it, it flows because it's like, you know, like my, my thinking on businesses used to be the Bruce Greenwald one. Like you decide to go up or down based on what you think the ROE for the up or down is. Mm. If the up is like really low ROE, why do you want to do it? Correct. There's a reason to do it. The reason is you your low ROE business at the top needs to make needs needs to be there to make sure your high ROE business succeed very well. If you have like different suppliers all the way, maybe, but you know, like like Apple can do it because Apple is like God of supply chain. Yeah. yeah. You, you they better squeeze the <laughs> Yeah. And and you better be God of supply chain if you want that to happen. But if you're let's say, like let's say on QL side, I'm sure they're very good supply chain, but then their thought process is you know, we're gonna handle the top and we'll handle the bottom and we'll run all of them very efficiently, mm. best in the best in Malaysia basically. Mm. And so they 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 settle their 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 family mart. But the thing is that if you look at the QL business and you separate them both, uh, mm. in my opinion. Uh, obviously previously even before Family Mart it was already like 40, 30, 40 PE. Yeah. In my opinion, the fam the 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 the, the convenience store business, Family Mart, is gonna be va- should be valued at way, way higher. Yeah. If again this is Malaysia Malaysia valuations due to Malaysia dynamics, uh, if yeah. this thing is like 30 PE, your convenience store should be at least in my opinion, uh, 200 times earnings. Mm. Literally 200 times because they are going to double or triple their earnings constantly. Yeah. It's, I know it's so crazy, like, you know, but you know, their growth rates merit that. They, they, it is literally doubling or tripling per year. Yeah. So, um, so on that basis, you know, I think myself, my news, okay. Uh, they, they don't have money problems. It's not really a money problem when it wants to open new stores. And you know, if I, if they start to hit back those growth levels, like 30% per year, mm. and, Let's say when this one really does well and then the, the boss one day wakes up and go, you know what? Uh, not one day wakes up, one day he has the data and then he looks at all of it and he goes, you know what? It really makes sense for me to just shift everything into my news. Yes. Or uh, to, to shift everything into CU. Or he really learned something from CU and then does some kind of rebranding for my news and then redo it. Like even now if you go to my news, the food is actually starting to get really decent. Like yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I've seen the change because uh, the my news near Plaza 163 used to be very dull. And now with the... Re yeah. uh, reshuffling and the rearrangement uh, is completely changed. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, so yeah, in that context, you know, obviously this will take time because again, now the number of stores or CU is just at one. I mm. think at the end of this one, there'll be like four or five. Okay. But um, and well, the number of my new stores is five hundred. So it, it it will probably take some time. But mm. I think if you give them about 
three to four quarters. I think it will take them maybe about two to three quarters for them to release the data. And then by the by the end of the year, assuming nothing changes, they will have at least 50, 50 CU stores. So that's about 10%. Mm. It may be higher because 50 CU stores was the plan before the insane growth happens for C before the boss stands there like shell shock looking at the <laughs> empty shelves. Now the boss stands there shell shock looking at empty shelves. He might go, you know what? We were planning to open like 30 my news. Maybe yeah. we should just shift all of that here. So it becomes mm. 80 stores. Mm. And then maybe let's say you give it three quarters and it looks at the amount of money coming in from that. It just makes sense because people are very log he's very logical. So mm. he will just be like, you know what? Why not we start converting <clears throat> Rather than hold on to his sentimental yeah. value of having, or or just because it's also a big jump, like, To be fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. five hundred versus yeah. So you, am you I, calculate the cost. Oh, sorry, am sorry. I right to say right that uh, because you, you so you're estimating three million per store using Family Mart as a mm. benchmark, but then currently my news stores are making one mil. Yeah. A, so am I right to say right? Actually, all it needs to happen is that the number of CU stores hit one third. Mm. Of my news level and basically your revenue doubles. Uh. Your your profit doubles. Uh. Profit doubles as well. Also, but so you, you think that the margins are basically the same? The margins form, are uh. going to be maybe slightly smaller, but the base is so much bigger. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So so, but so, if, it, so if they convert all three, right? Am I right to say that the mm. revenue potential is like yes, touching five yes. X kind of level? I mean, if I'm if you're right, my news is worth easily five if I'm not if I'm if you're right, if I'm right, yeah, and, yeah. and they actually like drive this thing like like mad. Is actually worth like five ten x, but obviously the problem with this industry versus let's say Mister DIY, mm. there's actually a competitor. Yes, 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 yes. And so whatever you're improving, Family Mart is also like yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's still a lot of space. You see, this this is a field there where you can two or three tigers. You yes, know? yes. And yes. then Seven Eleven is obviously big, and they're trying to do something. Their CEO is, uh, I think, from what I see, is quite competent, but they're not really like chong uh. No, because one thing is also skin in the game. Uh. Whereas, yeah. whereas like QL and, and um, uh, uh, sorry, my news, they really, really have skin in the game. Whereas these, these guys in a way, no matter how competent Jalil is, unless he is really having skin in the game. Uh, I, yeah. I don't mean Jalil, I mean the new 7-Eleven CEO. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. But the thing is that I think 7-Eleven is doing so well all the, all the, all this while that they are not, I'm not sure, I don't know if this is they're not, but they are not taking the drastic move I to see. make stuff happen. You I know, like see. their I recent promotion is like with Pepsi store. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> there's no queue Fake for coke. a Pepsi store. <laughs> <Fake coke>. <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, I mean, I, 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 I vividly remember when I traveled in Japan and, and, and uh, Korea and even Taiwan, right? We had lawsuits everywhere, every single corner. I was surprised. That, that was the first culture shock I had when I landed in Tokyo. And, you know, I, I'm just strengthening your thesis about convenience stores, they don't really, in, in a way, there is still a very big market, especially in urban areas in Malaysia. That's what I feel. Uh. Where yeah. I, I'm trying to throw in the devil's advocate is this. Is it only limited to urban areas? Now, you have to look at convenience stores. Obviously, it's very easy to be like, oh, all swans are white. You know, let's find yeah, more white swans. I, I, exactly, exactly. You're, like Munger says, always invert. So let's find countries that are, because my, the thesis is very simple. Develop, develop countries will have more convenience stores. That's yeah. the thesis. Yes. So you invert. Which developed country does not have much convenience stores? Mm. Singapore and Hong Kong. Mm. Why? You Singapore is very simple. They fully integrate the entire... Like, why would I go to a convenience store in Singapore if I walk downstairs and there's a supermarket? Yeah. yeah. The same the sing songs of this world. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're fully integrate. Like, it's literally MRT plus shopping mall and then plus plus condos and HDBs all around. There's Correct. no there's no need for, for convenience stores already other than like some really small ones. Yeah. And that's the same thing for Hong Kong. Hong Kong is also like... This, fully integrated into their transport system. Yeah. But if you actually have land... You know, you actually have land and you need to drive. You know, yeah, you want you want the my news. You want the, you want these convenience stores all around right. because it yes. makes sense. Yes. So, yeah. So that was my so that was my thinking in terms of my news. Yeah, but then obviously that like I said, they they have competitors and then there are also people who are now trying like don't don't then key all these people. They're yeah. trying to do yeah. something. So it is not super clear cut, mm. but it is definitely that you know. They, my news is starting off at a better base. I don't think Don Don Denki, the boss, have the same level of capital that let's say my news or Family Mart has. I understand. Family Mart is obviously in the best possible position because if they want to, they can spend one billion next year. It's not. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, the boss can borrow one billion. Yeah, you know, yeah. instantly it's not a problem. Yeah. So that so 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 the 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 real competition for me is really just 
Family Mart, lah. like the thing about 7-Eleven is that the boss is technically just a professional. Like what if a professional boss wakes up and go to Jalan and be like, you know, I want to borrow one billion <laughs> and open more stores. <laughs> He'll be like, well, you know, you need to keep your dividends up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, Jaliu may have that imagination, but are you sure you want to trust this guy? Well, down there is more of like, you have a very competent son, ex McKinsey, ex, I don't know what other Silicon Valley mm. name goes to his father, the daddy, yeah. doing well, let's, let's, let's hantam. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, hantam, yeah. hantam. Yeah. You know, so, so, so it's a different context, but I think my news, you know, they, if there should, there should, I, 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 I think the odds are still pretty good. Now you're at this price that you're buying, you know, you're, you're, you're paying obviously more. You're, I think now it's about 90 cents. You're probably around paying around 25 to 30 times normal earnings, Means? but that is normal earnings. If you, if I'm, if I'm right, and then the stores really are 3 million per store, da, 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 in one to two years, this might be actually be a really cheap price. But yeah. obviously, I have my other ideas as well, so I don't silang all in. But one thing to note about it, when I silang, one thing to note, anyway, is on diversification. The thing about diversification, like I said, I was about 80 to, to be frank, about 70 to 80% in my news at 57 cents to 61, 62 cents. I understand. Now, the first time it went up to 70, what law, what law, what law. Uh. But you have to know, uh, when it drops, uh, you see literally three years salary disappear in three days. Uh. <laughs> At that time, uh, now the thing is that back then I wasn't really able to meet management. I really, I understood the company, but my confidence levels was like 85%. You okay. see, I, I'm not sitting in there with the Korean consultants and then seeing their store, how they're doing correct, it. Correct, correct. I, I actually applied for a job at my news and I told the boss, like one of the main reasons I'm going to join you is so that I can hunt them all in into my news. If I can work for you, uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's awesome. laughs> I'm, I have 100% confidence. <laughs> you, you don't need to scare. I will score you in front of public if I have <laughs> so much chance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but obviously they, they were packed for the finance manager role or whatever. But yeah. so back then my confidence, so, so you know, I, I actually panicked a little bit. I sold about half at like the bottom ah. when they dropped again. But then the two days later I was thinking, but then I remember I had a talk with one farm manager and he was like, John, are you stupid? Uh? You need to understand. People think MCO is going to happen, but now they already announced MCO. People used to scat, man. No, no, scat. You know, we know what's going to happen. It's going to shoot up after that. And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, huh? <laughs> Why are you so stupid, huh? But yeah. you see, I can't think straight because I'm holding so much. So you have yeah, to understand yeah, diversity. Yes. You, you know, you better make sure you hold a percentage that you can think straight off. Yes. So next day I had to pay a bit more. I paid a bit more, 61%, go back 70%. And then I thought to myself, you know what? I, I already heart ache this three year salary gone. So I'm just going to stop looking at stocks completely for one year for, for one month and just play poker and then just <laughs> in hindsight I should play poker for two months uh, then yeah. I wouldn't have sold some at like yeah. 80 cents 80 yeah. plus cents you know I would yeah. wake up and like, oh one ringgit 10 cents okay I can sell some <laughs> okay so 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 that's my news which is on a pretty decent trajectory trend right yeah. now mm. that's all about something that has a reverse trajectory yeah uh, post Malaysia I think everyone knows this oh, uh, yeah. counter but uh I read your I read your 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 blog post and uh, I find it interesting, right? That there are changes happening in the company right now, and so just again share with us what are your thoughts, some thoughts on valuation and of course a risk. I think the problem with post is that if you look at all the logistics companies, they're all going crazy now. Yes, okay? especially like even GDEX. GDEX used to be I mean to be fair, GDEX was like a hundred PE company. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Then it dropped back down to like, I think a more logical and sane, you know, forty PE company. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's shooting back up to become a hundred PE company. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing about these logistics businesses is that number one, my thinking was that number one, uh, my posts have their own problems, which is that they are universal service providers for like all these lit letters, etc. But over the years, the Tansri Mokta, if we look at his businesses, the only ones that do badly are the ones where he is forced to run it. Mm. To be fair, if you look at his trade winds plantation, how on earth did the plantation get that big? You know, it's like, you know, this guy is, is so big that you can basically join with FGV and still have a whole meaningful stake. Yeah. So this guy is actually a, I mean, I, I don't I, I can't say too much because obviously there's a lot of stuff that people talk about like Mahate and you know yeah. this kind of I, I don't want to put the word out there because you know I I I'm not so rich to want to hire lawyers. Mm -hmm. But um so there's always that impression. But if you look at the his businesses, you know, he he's clearly logical and he's clearly trying to turn things around. So yeah. when I look at posts, the main problem with them was that universal service provider for all these letters, etc. But the way that they turn things around is basically they integrate these two things. So in the future, when they want to, when a person wants to send out packages, they also send out letters at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, in that case, is a reducing postal letters, all this kind of stuff, is it a good thing? It's actually, yeah, it's a really good thing. You want to send as little letters as possible, you see. 
So they already have this base. They already are. They 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 were growing faster than GDEX, which is a Tamase back company, mm. and and they have a lot of all these like really good dynamics going for them. But the only problem was that they still have one major problem, which is the union. Mm. But even if I do my math, you know, it's still it's actually fairly decent com- if you look at the margins wise compared to compared to GDEX. Like when I saw this video of this like postman crying in like March or April because, oh, oh, because of his, yeah. his his bonus was little. I was like, well, you know, clearly they're not overpaying them. You know, yeah. it's, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's such a horrible thing to do, but that's one thing you, what that happens when you become an investor. When you become an investor, be like, oh, they're underpaying you. I don't want to work for you, but I'll buy your stock. Exactly. The flip side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. it's like Aeon Credit. I don't want to work for them, but I'll buy the stock. But if like, hey, I'll work for you, but I don't want, <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not so keen on, on your stock. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Okay, so um, so when I look, but then obviously there's a lot of stuff in there that is you know it takes time to clear out. Like for example, the he previously merged it together with one of his logistics companies, the 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 other one, and then there's also the plane punya the the ones that that the supply for the planes. I remember there was a, I can't remember. I think it's like food stuff. Uh, they do supply food stuff to 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 airlines, all this kind of stuff. All okay. that are suffering, and then they also they have their pawn business, which is not doing so well in this kind of period. I see. So in the last quarter, there was a lot of impairments. Uh. I see. There was a lot of impairments and then they do MSS and then they do all this kind of stuff. So uh, it all hits last quarter. I see. Yeah. In terms of posts, I no longer hold it because when it went up a bit too fast, I was like, you know what? I This company needs to turn around. There's a lot of unknown factors. So I thought to myself, you know what? And then I had better ideas. So I sold it off first, and, but I kept track. Like. So, um, but if I think about that company, it's, I, I, I do not know what to really say now because I'm still... Because I have been too caught up in too many new ideas, I have not really looked at it again. But I was planning to actually sit down and go. And then, always the fourth quarter, the worst thing in the world happened. They had a COVID case in their biggest and most, and in, in, in their biggest and busiest uh, uh, logistics logistics hub. logistics hub. Like literally, when that happened, seventy uh, percent of their of their mail have to now be done by hand. Oh my gosh! Yeah, obviously your your cost is gonna shoot up like mad, like, It's like you know. So every all these kind of things move in the uh, a horrible Q four, but. If you go ahead, exclude those things out. If I look at the Q1, Q2, Q3 trend, it's actually really, it's doing really, really well. Mm, normalize it. La. Yeah. So in terms of posts, you know, obviously, you know, and then, yeah. So so in terms of posts, I I, I still think there are a lot of positive dynamics for it, but I need to study it more, la, basically. I understand. Right. But I mean, the thing about the, the, the thing about this e-commerce things is that, the this COVID thing has basically cre- created a supply imbalance, supply demand imbalance. Mm. Okay, so you know, and then, and as this supply demand imbalance happened, uh, the government says we're gonna block all new couriers. So ev- any expansion can only come internally. So there's only really the few guys, J and T, and then you know, GDEX and all these people who are now gonna expand their operations. Obviously, this is not as great a business as let's say, for example, uh, uh, let's say, let's say the convenience store one. Yeah. Because it's a very margin focused business. Mm. And on the day, if you're gonna go into the Shopee app, you look which is the cheapest one, you're gonna pick the cheapest one. Yeah, you don't care about branding or yeah. experience. Right. Yeah. And so so it's a commodity kind of business. So it I need to so and then but from what I see at least, the post Laju division, it used to do better than GDAX, which for me was like interesting class, mm. interestingly. Mm. So I'm not sure how J and T is doing. I probably should I would probably buy their accounts before I when I do a proper comparison, but you know, when it comes to commodities business, you want somebody who is doing better than 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 than, than the other peop- than the other person uh, because that's where the money is. Mm. You know, so, so where do you think if if there was an edge for post versus the rest, where where do you what do you think that is? Their edge used to be that they are much more widespread. They have a lot more of these uh shops, which yeah. is they are forced to have these shops. But the thing is that you look at J and T now, they're also opening a lot of all these yeah. shops already. Yes. So, so I think. But the thing about this kind of age is that, that it's getting finer and finer and finer. It's getting mm. smaller and smaller. There's mm. The thing about, like, if you look at, let's say, my news, for example, versus Family Mart, is there really an age? Not really big of an age. They, they might, you might even say there's no age over Family Mart, but the industry is growing very quickly. Mm. And, the, and the consumers are not price conscious. In the case of Post, the industry is growing, but not super quickly. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not like there's a, it's not like there was an under, there was a, there was too too little supply previously, like let's say convenience stores. This one, the, the supply is actually quite adequate. Mm. Only that it recently boomed. Yes. So, um, so in in terms of like looking at the the business, obviously I don't I in my opinion, just my opinion is I don't think it's as wonderful as let's say you know 
it is as good as let's say like my news up for example or time.com yeah right. but it's you know it's a cyclical kind of look because well every single thing has hit the sink already and it's been basically stabilizing in 90 cents so mm. if you would link of it in terms of like a short term let's say three month to six month perspective because you're because this one i'm not sure if you can invest i i do not know yet i i, I know they are trying to turn things around i know they're working really hard but i do not know whether you can it's an investment mm. but if you think of it as a trade it's been consolidating and that price for so long after all the bad news has hit. So on that basis, you can think to yourself, well, the next three months, the price will also be around 85 cents or so. Right. Mm -hmm. But then the upside is that, well, if Q1 is really a lot better than what it is, which it should be because they, they settled all their, their stuff before their that. Their teething issues. Huh? Yeah. And obviously, if if they solve those teething issues and then, you know, then whatever they need to shut down, they have shut down, just left the the the, the one that supplies the planes that is, that is making some small losses. Then, you know, it, I mean, it's like the MSM kind of thing, you know. The thing about Malaysia is that you want to really look for those that are not doing well and then suddenly do well. Because when they're not doing well, the Malaysian market just thinks it's worth zero. Ignores mm. them or yeah. devalues then, them, yeah. And then when it starts, when it turns green, everybody... Just who, jumps who, on the bandwagon. <laughs> everybody yeah. with a telegram group is going to wake up. <laughs> and then, and because they're incentivized to wake up, then, <laughs> and then they're going to they're gonna, they're, they're, they're gonna start writing their stories. Uh, I mean... I try and I try and write my story before it turns green. Uh, right, right. So that, so that, but yeah, and then everybody's gonna wake up, everybody's gonna know all the Chinese channels will be like, Da <laughs> So you know, then you're gonna what because then people are gonna be like, it's an like MSM, like there's no way on earth that I mean, not no way on earth. There's but, a small possibility that it's worth the current price, but it will be politically correct, <laughs> given what I know about the company. There is no, it, it shouldn't be worth this amount because the reason why their profits are so high is because they signed a long term. Uh, 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 I'm not sure how long was the contract for the raw sugar at low price. Okay. So this is only as long as the contract lasts. When this contract ends, are you sure it's worth 1.5 ringgit versus the 55 cents that it was before right. that? I understand. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next. Server dynamic. Oh. So do you own the stock? <laughs> <laughs> Server dynamic, I used to own. That. So I bought it because Philip really liked it. And then I know, I now the thing about Philip is that we argued a lot, Yeah, but I have to give him credit that he's thinking, I, let me put it this way, he's not, when we first met, he was not so good at putting down his thoughts nicely and clearly. He <laughs> tends to get a little bit, he tends to, he tends to feel a little bit defensive and then he tends to lash out, like for example. Mm. So, I'm me and me and Ricky on on i three. I think our questions on on QL was quite correct. And then he didn't exactly predict the family mart to be three million in per revenue per store instead. So we were telling you know are you sure it makes sense? Are you sure the valuation makes sense when the revenue is one million etc. So he really lashed out. But he really changed my mind in terms of how I think about businesses. Mm. That's how I scale. So when he and he was a he has a very deep experience into petroleum. Yeah. So I thought to myself, you know what? In that case, since you are so big into server dynamic, you know what? Fine. I will sit down and look at it. So I bought a little bit, like mm. maybe like 0.5% or whatever, just so that it's in my head. Yeah. And I started studying. Um, in general, they are really, really good at MRO kind of stuff, all these kind of things. But the very interesting thing that I find is that if you look at their growth and how they, they manage their balance sheet and their cash flows, before they list the there was never, uh, there wasn't much of a case where they do private placements or or or, or all this like fundraising all the time. Mm. But after the list, they do this a lot. Mm. So now, obviously, there's 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 like my friend said, like for my friend told me, he said the guy who bought the one million shares from Hata Lega Boss, he actually didn't want to buy the shares because Hata Lega Boss selling the shares. Or why would you buy a, a the? Do you think that a company whose boss sell the shares right after it lists is a good company? Mm. Well, clearly it was, uh, you know, just because there's a red flag doesn't mean it's a bad idea. You yeah, see? yeah. So I thought to myself, okay, let's be open-minded. Let's look at it. Maybe they really have, maybe, you know what? This guy really has a very big plan for the future. And then since you're listed, you might as well make use of it. Most people just list and don't do anything, which makes Correct. me think it's like for ego purpose or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you're literally listing and not doing anything. So, um, so I thought to myself, so I studied. Now, the interesting thing that I found is there's a few things that I find very interesting. Number one, for some reason, most people will be like, let's stick to your age and what you know. This guy goes and does like MRO to everything else, and then now he's down IT, and then now and then now he's doing solar, mm. and then now he's doing apparently he wants to go to space. Yep. 
how come every single thing you do that is literally not within your same field yet, it might be slightly adjacent, but it's not really within your own field. You know how to do rotating equipment. How do you know how to do solar suddenly? Yeah. How come it's all gold? Yeah. How can you touch everything and Midas, it does gold? Midas touch. Uh. And, and you think about solar contracts, uh, like you're telling me SCIB or, or all this, like uh, what's the other one? K-Power, now yeah, they want to do yeah. solar or, or what? Like previously, previously they are not doing well. How come after you touch, they do well? So you're saying you can get some amazing contracts that these people can suddenly execute, execute? Like these people, it's not like their competence level jump through the roof the next day, you see? Yeah. You're buying over the company. So how how, how come it, it just happens like that? So, and then the second thing that I find very interesting, uh, since 2016, I think I listened to 2016, right? After the list, mm. before that, most of the business was in Malaysia. After that, if you study their business, most of the growth uh, is coming from Qatar. Or UAE, Saudi, mm-hmm. and UAE, etc. Yeah. But if you read the accounts, uh, Qatar and UAE accounts are not audited due to not required by regulation. <laughs> now, here's a very interesting question. Uh, why is, if it's not required to be audited, exempt from audit, and it's not under regulation, but you're spending easily 500 million a year yeah. into there for KPEX, uh, and let's not talk about working in working capital, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. If you're a public research company and you want to make people have faith in you, shouldn't you just like audit it yeah. and then like show it out, you know? And it's so interesting. Like every single year, the inventory can go up like a huge amount, but the turnover days stay the same, etc. Mm-hmm. So I wonder to myself, if a company listed, if a company in Qatar where you're spending 500 million a year easily in KPEX, and then let's just say maybe another two, 300 a year additional in working inventory, mm. and it's not listed, I don't know what is happening. Maybe there's nothing happening. Maybe it's really just a really brilliant man and everything's going right. Mm. But if you look at it in terms of probability, in terms of balance of probabilities, you know, if you if you want a red flag, this is as big as a red flag as you can do. I mean, if you give me the similar company and you let me have this kind of structures and I can just, let's just say as an ex-auditor, I can do some really amazing stuff with that thing. Mm, I mean, mm, if, mm. if I want to move stuff, I can just do. So, but again, you know, the company, they, they are really competent in terms of their MRO. I'm not sure about the other parts of businesses. I'm trying to study SCIB and K-Power, et cetera. But the moment I saw that unaudited and every year 500 million going there via KPEX into UAE, et Now they have obviously a lot of like the same these projects in UAE, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But when I look at the projects, it's like, number one, they say it's a 10 billion project in UAE. I look at it, it's like a housing development or whatever. No, I mean some kind of like training centers or etc. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if that based on the the what the, the picture they show me, if it's possible to spend 10 billion ringgit on that. Like, I mean 10 billion ringgit you can I think you might be able to build a Burj Al Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I if I'm not mistaken, the Burj yeah. Al Dubai was built for around around 10 billion ringgit or so, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. I, okay. Yeah. So I, I look at it from that context and then I'm like, you know what? I don't know if you are, I I, 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 I think there's enough things for me there to make me go, you know what? I'm not so interested to find out. Mm. Now, interestingly, when I spoke about this to, 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 to other people, okay, they were like, you know what? We're actually not sure how to find out about this. I actually don't know how to verify this. Only then, then they started. They out. didn't really sell. I don't know if they sold, but they say that they because you know, like Philip, obviously he talks to all the people, and then they they, they really are paying cash for all their Malaysian projects. Mm. They are getting really good prices. They are very efficient on all the kind of stuff. They are they are Petronas, you know, winners and and you know like supplier list all the kind of stuff. So Malaysia wise, they're doing very well. But the question I'm thinking to myself is that if any hanky panky is going on, who really knows the 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 the, the what what's really going on? For the Qatar or the Middle East expansion, right? You know, um, John, you, you and I have talked about buying SSM reports mm. on looking at subsidiaries that don't file public accounts. Yeah. Is there an avenue from your research? Is there an avenue for, for retail investors to actually check that for UAE companies or Middle East? I have no idea how to do it. Okay. I really have no idea. I, For some reason, this ability to buy annual reports is quite unique in Malaysia. <laughs> you try and do that in Singapore. I've been trying to do that for Singapore. I just can't. Wow. There's a reason why, for example, like Palantir accounts are not public until until they want to go the IPO. IPO. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this this thing is quite unique in Malaysia. Mm. Do you give us a sense, right? If someone wants to buy uh, annual reports for private companies, how much would it would it cost them? Um, you need to pay about ten ringgit first, so that they will let you buy the annual report based on the thing. Each time you want to buy, you need to pay ten ringgit, and then per annual report is around fifteen ringgit. Now, also one thing to note, uh, for most people, especially for me, the thing is that I'm always. 
I save pennies and lose dollars. That's a lot of my thesis. So mm. I remember when the first time I bought a lot of petrol M, I wanted to study the sister company, Petrol International Malaysia, that holds the other petrol stations that is not under the, the group company. Mm. I bought, I think, I uh, let's just say it's a lot of money. Lah, hmm? But the annual reports uh, is going to be less than even 10% of my transaction costs. Uh. Mm, mm. But I just didn't want to buy, you know. I just wanted to mm. save that. It's, Mental block. Uh. Man, it's, it's, it, but it's utterly foolish, you know. It's like, you know, you're, you're putting that much money, you might as well buy it. So it took me about one week of like, are you, are you are you asking myself, are you, are you, are you something wrong? Uh? Now that I was like, oh, no, man, just, 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 just buy it. Now that I started buying that, I started buying a lot of annual reports all the time. Mm. But... I think when whenever you're investing in general, you don't want to stinge on the little, little yeah. 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 So again, like before you even start investing, if you have zero background, come and talk to Phil. <laughs> just just pay that. I don't know how much is it. Yeah, it's not it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg, like, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's say I think it's like less than less than less than four figures, right? Less than four oh, figures. Definitely. Damn. <laughs> less than four is figures. it less than five? It's, it's hundred and sixty nine years. Oh dollars, my right? gosh, hundred and sixty nine. I my trend I just buy annual reports isn't gonna cost you that much, and I'm sure, <laughs> and I'm sure a transaction cost is gonna cost you that much even after just like four or five months anyway. Yeah. So, like, really, just just do this, and then you know, just listen, and then you 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 figure out. So it's like always don't don't penny pinch on the on the on on the what like like for me right now, I'm trying to force myself to sign up for you guys when you petrol chemicals and buy the semi con one, even <laughs> yeah. though, even though even though I'm still like have this penny pinching kind of feeling, <laughs> but I I'm like you know what I probably have to buy it. You know, it's like I, 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 I have to, to I have to thank him for one thing. You know, he was. Uh, Gabriel, our videographer, and I, we were talking about monitors and I was having a problem having two big monitors. And then I saw a penny pincher like John going by the Mi 34-inch white, right? I said, okay, since John already studied it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a John indicator. <laughs> it's a John it's a indicator. John indicator. Yeah. It's a no-brainer for if me If he buy. buys, you can too. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, so. Is that is that all your thoughts about Sudan? I can't dynamic? say much, but for me, the red flags is a bit too red. Okay. Understand. Understand. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So let's uh, go from uh, Malaysia to where I think your focus now is transitioning a little bit in terms of your 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 fund, which is the US. And I think two stocks in particular that you're really interested in is Palantir uh, and Apple. Yeah. Now, before I think the Apple is very easy for people to understand, but what does Palantir actually do, mm-hmm. and why are you interested in this in the company? Oh, Palantir one. This one is quite interesting. Um, I remember when I f- when I Palantir first IPO, I thought to myself, "There's no way on earth I'm buying that stuff." <laughs> it's like billions of losses, even after I think sixteen years of operating. Yeah, I thought to myself, "There's no way on earth." Until a very smart friend of mine. I think he's also very rude. I think oh. you might know who he is. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he wrote. Do about- I know? Do I know? Yeah, him? yeah, yeah, yeah. He got caught, kicked out of the WhatsApp group. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy, okay. the guy is brilliant, yeah. but but let's just say he does not suffer fools, la. <laughs> Okay, so he or, or or suffer just wrong, wrong or foolish, slightly foolish statements. He just does not suffer that. Yeah. So uh, when he said, you know, I'm gonna hantam palantir, I was like, you know what? Since you said that, I'll probably study it. Yeah. So I studied it a bit, and then I then even at just like studying, just like a couple, like like just a little bit on the. I, prospectus and some of the seeking alpha articles. Yeah. I had a feeling that this was a game changer, but all my money was in Malaysia and then it went from nine ringgit to forty dollars and nine dollars <laughs> to forty dollars. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I think it peaked at forty one, I think. Yeah. Oh, 40, and then yeah. now there's a bit of a decline. I think right it's now. not twenty twenty plus. Twenty two. Uh, yeah. So I've yeah. been buying some at twenty two. Now the thing about Palantir for me is that number one, um so now let's say you think you know data is oil. Okay. Now so we if you look at the data space there is so many companies. Oh yeah, data. of course. Tableau, okay. um, a lot. Uh. You can you can split them into basically people who do the analytics work and then, but even the people who do the analytics work and the people who hold your data lake, etc. They also have a lot of analytics capabilities it's, as well. It's overlap actually. I, yeah. that, that, that's why I was there's saying. There's a big overlap. Yeah. But if you think about right. this thing, uh, there's actually really two big categories. There's the first data, there's a first group, which is this AWS, GCP and, and you know Snowflake, all of them, yeah. where they are in the business of helping you store larger and larger amounts of data for cheaper and cheaper prices and, and helping you process them and do analytics on them in a simpler and faster manner. Yeah. Okay. But the thing is that this particular category, you it's basically you need an army of data analysts in your company. Mm. And the insights, are, if you look at the process of how people will derive insights, are, you imagine the Uber CEO, you know what, what happens if I increase the 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 the, 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 the incentives for, for this particular region? How will it impact? He will need to tell his his he will need to raise it up in a meeting, 
and then tell the analyst. And then he's, oh yes, boss. Then he go down there and he go and do his digging. He do his analysis. He's doing and then after he know the data, he goes and prepare a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> <laughs> and he prepare the PowerPoint slide. He go and meet the boss. Hi, boss. And then there's a <laughs> ten people meeting in the room. Hi, boss. So you know if you do this, then you like, oh, so we increase the amount it's like that lah. Then after the boss is like, in that case, uh, how will it impact our let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say in terms of our finances or in terms of like where do we need to allocate this money from? Da, 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 da. And then in terms of let's say we do it like this, will there be any like? Will there be drivers who, who focus on this area and don't focus on the other areas? What are my second order impacts? So you have to ask, finances, turn to CFO, hi CFO, how are you? <laughs> how, how will it impact? Uh? Where where the money need to come from? Uh? Do we have enough in terms of our burn? How will it affect our burn rate? Da, da, da. And now they turn left to the other guy, this one is probably like traffic or like or like whatever. It's like, in general, when we increase this thing, uh, how, how, how will it impact the flow of the other parts? Now, you see at uh, this process, uh, you, number one, there's a lot of disparate data sources. That's correct, one. Correct. And number two, there is a lot of different links and some of the information is known by, this guy knows how to derive this insight. Correct. But it happens with him. What if he's not there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so <laughs> what Palantir does is that they are basically Microsoft, but yes. for data. Yes. So imagine you see uh, this insight that the CEO asks, uh, what if you increase incentives? Uh? Yeah. It's really just a question, right? Yeah. And it's and it and this question is actually very automatable. Mm. These are insights. And if you go by in industry by industry, every single industry will have the top obviously 10, 100 questions where it helps in your operations. Once you it's like a checklist, you see. Once yes. you know all these all these questions and how to derive the data quickly and how it affects all your moving parts, you don't need an analyst anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So that is where Palantir comes in. Now the interesting thing here is this. I I've I've been in a lot of like ERP conversion system conversion kind of like kind of like uh stuff accounting system and or like and I can tell you a number one uh, the process of this changing from let's say SAP to, to, to Oracle Oracle oh. is an utterly painful process and that is if your data is already in SAP format yes okay if your data is not in SAP format it's in whatever format that you used to do in your own system and you want to change it to SAP right. You can actually fail after spending hundreds of million. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Aldi in the UK spent almost five hundred million in four years to change system, and they couldn't change. Why? Because Aldi used last in first out, but for inventory, while while SAP is first in first out, <laughs> and they cannot do this. And I can tell you, uh, like very simple, uh, like even for like the ones I've been through, uh, I will just be like, you know what? This is the you you can you can display to me the name of the account code, right? Can yes. you put the account code aside as well? Yeah. Or maybe like the the trees as well. Oh no, our cannot. system cannot do this. Very rigid. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at the way that these people run their business, it is or Oracle is like or let's say let's say SAP or Oracle, there is like they'll be like, I have this perfect model of a house that I've created. Um and you need to fit all your house and all your requirements into, into this house. This frame. <laughs> and let's say somebody goes, Oh, I it fits okay, but you know, I have a door at my floor. Don't ask me why. I have a door at my floor. And this door goes on in the room that's in the shape of a triangle. Don't ask me why the room is the shape of a triangle. It's just triangle because that's how it is. Hmm. Can you do that? Oracle will be or or SAS or whoever or SAP will be like, oh, I can't do that because you see the the the, the floor we have put in some foundations etc. What I can do is I can build you a room that is not triangle but it's square on the roof, <laughs> and then I can give you a ladder from your current floor to the roof. To, to a door at the roof, yeah. and then you can take the ladder and you go up and you can go in the room there. Yeah. It's pointless. Yeah. And if you look at all these ERP systems, it is in general there for to record data because they do not, they are not able to see second order impact so much. Yes. So they're there to record data and then people need to somehow link this data together. It's a repository more than yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at or at, at Palantir, what they do, uh, now this is the thing that just blew my mind. Uh. Mm. They walk into the room uh, and then they ask these people. Tell me what is your hardest problem and your most difficult question and let me solve that. Mm. Oh my God. You go to talk to SAP, they tell you, this is a very difficult problem. Oh, you, you shouldn't have this problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should forget about this problem. Use my problem. <laughs> so so they, they start from that basis and then after that, they will customize their systems for you. Now, if you look at that basis, uh, in a, from, for the US, uh, they spend easily a billion. And if you look at, let's say, when they first started doing banking clients, mm. Like the the first time I went into a bank, which was Deutsche, oh my god! The first year they only managed to do one use case, wow. which is basically one question. Then the second year, five, six, then ten, twenty, thirty, thirty. 30. No, but here's the thing: these use cases after or, or archetypes, which they call, once you know yes. what are the questions and how to and where the data all come from, the next client is a lot faster. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So for the last 14, 16 years, they've been spending billions on this. 
now if you look at it, I mean, to be fair, this is the data that they show, so it might not be like 100%. But if you look at the data that they show, like last time, the it took like Deutsche for like almost like five years to reach to like maybe a hundred use cases. Now yeah. the banks will get the to about sixty use cases in just the first year. Yeah, and within the first week they already have a few use cases ready, and because they are paid by by use case by licensing from there, so it will do very well. Now the second part you have to ask yourself is this: who is actually using this this data? You see now if you say data is oil, there's no point to use the data if the data is not done automated and make it and give you operational insight straight away. Yeah. And the, the faster you can simplify this process, the, the better it is. Now, if you look at, let's say the reviews or let's say Snowflake, uh, who is the one answering? Hi, my name is uh, Doge. I'm, 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 the, I'm the data engineer from, from you know, this company. They're all data engineers. They're all head of, head of analytics, whatever. You go and talk to, you look at the reviews for Palantir. It's a CEO answering. Yes. It's a commissioner police. Now, what this means is that <clears throat> their stuff is being used operationally by people on the ground. Yes. Like you look at the BP, like BP actually used that and then they instantly save 50 million. Like which ERP system saves you money? No way. Exactly. No way. And if you think about it, if this thing is going to save me money, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like you are selling Microsoft, Microsoft Windows, Microsoft to somebody who has never used Microsoft or doesn't have that. They're all on pen and paper. Yes. And then like, here's a Windows, Microsoft. You're like, Holy crap. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah. It's like a big age. So, that's the so if so and then you look at and then like for example the skywise the one that the airbus does it you know airbus after they did that people are learning like re, like a lot of maintenance work that used to happen after it it goes wrong now they can do the predictive maintenance before that yeah yeah, yeah. real time they can actually save you money and the people reviewing are people who are actually using it so when i look at it from the context i think to myself who is the competitor <laughs> Now, maybe for the banks, there's Encino. I've not really studied Encino, so maybe, but that's what people are telling me is Encino. But if you look at it from, let's say, the perspective of, let's say, uh, uh, a mining company, or industrial company, who is the competitor? I literally... Actually, there's closer. Um, one, but it's very, very niche. Uh. Um, one is actually Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce or GE. Mm. They have their own in-house analytics team that has, uh, like Rolls-Royce, they actually have sensors uh, installed for every engine that flies. They can give you real-time predictive, but it's very industry-focused because it's really to their product. Yep. But for a generalistic one, uh, I don't think uh, Palante, there's any close competitor. La. I mean, yeah, I have to disclose first, I'm also an owner of Palante. So I'm, same, same. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm actually, owners, yeah. actually very, in, uh, say the, share the same enthusiasm as Jonathan, but obviously we have to keep out of our blind it's spots. A bit like, yeah. It's a yeah. bit like the ultimate CEO assistant. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, let's say you're, you're going from the GE Rolls Royce one. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, even that data you have is, siloed to that particular correct, use correct, case. Correct, exactly. correct, correct. Like imagine if you're a CEO and you ask yourself, well, what if my, what, my, what if let's say I have an additional 50% 50, 50 increase in, in, in flights for this particular area. If, you, if, your, if your company is linked into Palante, you should already know number one, how many additional planes you need. Yeah. Okay. And then if, if you don't have enough planes, where you can reallocate the planes from. Yes. If you need to buy who you can buy from and what's the price and yeah. what's your current contracts, what is your prices based on current contracts. Yeah. And if you have, let's say you have the planes, you have the capacity, how many additional staff do you need? And then if these planes fly more, what's, what's the additional predictive maintenance that you need? So you ans you instantly have all your questions answered. I remember I was watching this 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 video of when they do the, the military to got operation. I was like, that looks like it's from Hollywood. It, yeah. It's a it's a video game. Actually, there's a there's a term for it, uh, Jonathan. It's called rapid forward deployment. So that yeah. means if you land on a base in Iraq, now can you imagine, right? You want to set up a data center. If in KL, you've got fibers. You just plug in and then mm. that's it, right? Can you imagine if you land in war torn Iraq, right? Yeah. There's no such thing as GSF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no infrastructure at there's, all. There's no everything. Yeah. Palante can set up a forward uh, rapid deployment base in three days. Uh. So for me, it's like because I I love watching thriller movies, you know, and mm. all that, right? I said, for as an engineer, I think, uh, my God, I have to work with this kind of limited resources, mm. and yet I can have. Uh, the the commander, the field commander, having all access to whatever resources I have uh, at my fingertips and just uh, yeah. it, it, it it just blows my mind away. So, so I I have a I have a question right because yeah. I think this is a this is quite a like like you rightly pointed it's a mind blowing thing. Yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong. Right now, a lot of their clients are more military. Is no, it's right? starting to get a mix. Starting to get a mix, right? Yeah. So what are you, what do you think is uh, potential challenges if when they move on from you know sovereign clients to more business. I think if you type. look at it from your commercial client perspective, 
they have already d- have clients in almost every single industry before. Yes. So wow. you see, like remember when I said the initial capex when they first go in, mm. that's really the R and D cost. Actually, it, it should have it should actually be capitalized, but accounting is 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 different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Asia as a client, just 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 for you. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the second one is you look at government. Now, if you look at government, um, like why did they spend almost a billion dollars into the U.S. government one? Number one, it's if you talk about disparate sources of data or challenges in like the the sheer number of not number of data, it's number of types of data. Mm. There's nothing going to be harder than the U.S. military, which has like almost got no so many systems, so many blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah, man. Yeah, but the re- but the the reason why it went up was because there was basically a law. Palantir sued them under that law and that basically said that if there is already an alternative and good enough commercial use item, you cannot go and force yourself to create a system. Mm. And the US government spent easily hundreds of billions making their own systems yeah. every single year. Yes. So now that they are able to use that contract, obviously it's growing very fast. But the thing is that their commercial side is also growing. It's actually growing faster than the military yeah, yeah. side. The foundry. The foundry, yeah. yeah. So, and and obviously because it, if it makes money, you you will, you if it, if if, if this ERP system will actually make you money, uh, you're, mm. you're not going to slow down in your deployment of it, you see? Yeah. So, um, if you look at, so just if you look at the US part, uh, like per year, the US spends, I think, around 200 or $300 billion on just like system maintenance and this kind of stuff. Yeah. What if you use a Palantir system? Number one, you no longer need to spend that amount. Number two, it's everything is interlinked. But let's say, uh, now if you look at their, their, their systems, it's being used by it's being used by more and more, let's say, police departments in yes, the US. Yes. And now the health and safety are using. And then I think over time, it was slowly going. Even COVID, there was a big use case for COVID for Palantir, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But imagine you ask this question one day. Uh, one day, I think over time, it will just expand more and more into not just US government, but at least they, they don't want to work with China. I don't I don't know if I like that. But maybe it's a commercial. They say it's a philosophical choice. Maybe it's a commercial one, whatever. Because it's hard to work for China and then work for work for US. US yeah, it'd be quite time. crazy, yeah. Yeah. But imagine... What if one day Obama just wakes up and I want to ask this question, but instead of having to have 10 million people go and run around and get the data for me, I can just query into my Palantir. Yeah. Not Obama. Now it's not Obama. Now it's, now <laughs> Biden, it's Biden. Biden, Biden yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it, it, it makes sense. Like saying I, I, I want to use Microsoft Office. It's, yeah. No, no, my Windows. I just want to use Windows. It's, I need an OS. So for me, I know they're saying that their thumb is, you know, it's like the, the, the US military kind of spending and stuff, but I think the thumb is basically every single organization that's large enough yes. that they can spend. Yes. Because there's literally no reason for you to not spend if it's going to sa- like BP the moment they use it and it's save 50 million. Let's sign a nine figure contract right now. Yeah. 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 I, I'm fairly certain over time BP is just going to use, it's like going to be using Windows. Everybody will have access to whatever part that they need to have access to. Yeah. And obviously the, the capabilities need to increase. Yeah. But after you use a Palantir, uh, you try and shift system from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you the ask stickiness. People, yeah. 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 Like ERP, at least you can shift. Imagine if you're Palant- you you ask people to shift your entire company from Windows to, li- to Linux and see. <laughs> <laughs> you would rather die. <laughs> you yeah. just use the Windows all the time, you know. It's like very few companies even change from Windows to Mac. And the Correct. only way it's changeable is because Mac runs on, Windows runs on There's Mac. There's an emulation. Uh, yeah. 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 There's Rosetta 2 and, and all that, and the original Rosetta and all the stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, there is no way on earth the moment you're using this software, you're ever cutting it if yes. you're using it for a long time. Like there are some clients, if I'm not mistaken, that, that cut. I remember there was a hardware company in the US that after they tried them for a few months, they cut. But in general, if you've been there for a long time, there was only one scenario where it cut. I think it was some spy thing, but yeah. all of them have, have all held and then they, they are using it more and more. Yeah. And they will use it more and more because the more I use, the more money I save. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. How much savings do you think, on average, if you blend it out, uh, that Palantir will give their clients? I have no idea. Like, as you're saying, how much savings would you give to someone if they finally discovered what Microsoft Windows is and what Office right. is? It's very hard to quantify, I guess. Right. It's just yeah. your life becomes so simple. So suddenly, <laughs> everybody is like making making stuff happen. You see. Right. Okay. So, actually, there was a good. Uh, parallels to this was uh, when I, I can't even pronounce his name because Louis Jersner mm-hmm. when he was uh, IBM CEO mm-hmm. uh, he wrote this book uh, called uh, Who Says Elephant Can Dance and one of the key parallels that I drew the mental model that I had when I saw Palante when I when I looked at it and studied it was, was actually what Louis Jersner was trying to implement he he had IBM had these massive mainframe systems and one of the struggles was actually getting the mainframes and all this in <coughs> siloed systems talking together and Louis Jersner actually focused on this thing called middleware. 
So middleware was actually to pull all this disparate data yep. to actually make sure that they can work together. That was the one of the first things that I saw for Palantir. Mm. Yeah. So you know, if you guys want to read up sure. a little bit more about it, just read up about middleware. And this this was the problem that IBM was solving in the eighties. When I saw that, and I saw that Palantir was like. Mm. It's basically like cutting down hundred step processes to like five. Correct. It's like yeah. it's like it's like the French and the Italian and everything. Somehow now you're blending all this disparate siloed data to make it used together. Mm. It's yeah. like you got you've got logistics, you've got accounting systems, you've got let's just say uh inventory planning, and it's all in these separate softwares. And what Palante is trying to do is actually merge them together to make it insightful. That, yes. that's, that's how I would put it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very smart assistant. Yeah, yeah it's very, a very, very, smart, very assistant. Smart, smart assistant. Yeah. Jarvis, actually, it's Jarvis. Right? Yeah, it's Jarvis. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, actually, it's Jarvis. Right, <laughs> uh. yeah. hey guys, that, that, that is the thesis. Yes. Jarvis, yes. do you believe in Jarvis or not? <laughs> yeah. But okay, so uh, I want to touch a little bit about on the, on the other side, right, which is uh, some of the risks. Yeah, right? what's the risk? What do you think is the biggest case against Palantir? Now, if you look at valuations, uh, now, the problem with their valuation is that, number one, if you look at their historical share-based payments to their employees. Correct, correct. Okay, ah. it's actually only around 200 million a year. But last year, it was around a billion. Mm. Why was that? Mm. Because a lot of employees bought their shares cheap and then the options, every time the share price go up, you have to do some revaluation, etc. So the cost actually increased. Yeah. So actually, in if the share price keep going up, you can expect the, the, the losses to increase. But that's not because they are giving more shares. That's because the previous shares that they gave- The options that they gave, yeah. It's yeah. not worth a lot more. Yeah. So if you look at it from a P&L perspective, there's obviously that one. The second risk, I suppose, if you look at valuation, uh, buying Palante now is like buying Google at $60 in 2000. <laughs> that, that's no, not Google, sorry. Amazon at Amazon, 2000. Yeah. yeah, but $60, it dropped to $9. Yes. Mm. You, 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 you better be ready. It might not happen because this is data, the, the information flowing much The much disparity better. or the, what do you call it? The information dissemination is getting less. And yes. Less. Yeah. And also, Carp and Peter Thiel, they are very smart at making sure the data, the information is disseminated out properly. Yes. So, so it's like it's like a Netflix. Everybody will always say it's, it's overvalued. Yeah. But you wait until it's 10 p and buy. That time you, uh, yo, it's <laughs> really price, 100 times the current price. It's yeah. like you forget about it. Yeah. You know? So, because again, the answer is all future cash flows is going to back to present value. Yes. So now, the thing about valuation in general, uh, now, if you go back to when Warren Buffett first started Berkshire Hathaway, the per share is about $17. Yeah. If you bought that seventeen dollars at forty dollars per share, it's like it will probably be a hundred PE then, and mm. it, and you would probably take about five years to make back your money. But the thing is that today is about three hundred and fifty, three hundred eighty thousand yeah. dollars. I think it hit four hundred already. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, yeah. So the thing is that when you do valuation, uh, oftentimes if you oftentimes oftentimes if you Oftentimes when the management is good and the business is great, everything uh, and no man not good when the management is fantastic. Just and the business is fantastic. No matter, almost it's almost as if whatever price you put, uh, you're gonna undervalue it. Yeah. Like you, it might make sense to buy the damn Berkshire shares for like five hundred dollars in the first year. You know. Yeah. It might make sense. Yeah, you need to wait ten years, but after that, you look that, dumb, la. You look dumb, la, In the, in <laughs> yeah, the short, in, in ten years, la, Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, it might. But so, so, so from that perspective, uh, I, when it comes to companies that, so now if you look at management, uh, Peter Thiel, uh, so I so I thought to myself, the only way that I can buy this business is if number one, the business economics is just fantastic to the point of not being able to be more fantastic, which okay. Palantir is, mm -hmm. in my opinion, the yeah. current business is. The second part is management. Is the management so fantastic until there's just no comparison? Mm. Okay. Uh Peter Thiel is just next level. I read his books, I sat through, I went and listened to all of his speeches, etc. Oh, yeah, he's he's, he's uh, good stuff. He's, yeah. he's good stuff, man. He's very logical. Yeah. He, he make I mean, I oh his his companies, oh it's so hard to buy one. Even his biotech company, <laughs> yeah. like, shoot like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, I I don't know how to buy that. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understand biotech so well, but he is a very logical person when I I, I actually learned a lot from his books and, and from Which his, one? Zero to one, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And listening to him talk. So I thought to myself, you know what? I think the management is also very top-notch. Mm. So uh, the thing is that, but I don't know if I can sit through a 60 to $10 drop. It probably won't drop that much, but it may, it may not. Mm, mm, mm. So for me, I put, I told myself to cap it at like maybe 5% for I see, now. I see. Okay. Of the fun. Uh. Even then, if you hold 5% of Amazon back then, oh, you're yeah, still going to be huh? damn blood. You still be be liao already, yeah. Yeah, you, you hot liao. Uh. No <laughs> time to talk to fur. No <laughs> people don't want to talk. Hey, keep I, quiet. I, I bought Amazon at uh, 1,005. And mm. I thought that back then, I was like thinking, 
John, are you crazy? <laughs> Thousand five hundred is the most expensive shit I ever bought. Mm. But when I look back, right, I wasn't so dumb. <laughs> actually, yeah. I wasn't so actually, dumb. Actually, if you took out the R and D cost for Amazon, yeah. It's actually selling on it. Back then, they were not mistaken, like 20p. Yeah, 20p. Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Nothing is nothing. Yeah, What's yeah. R&D? But, actually, but actual KPEX that cannot be capitalized due to... It's just a matter of do you think the R&D is useful or not? Accounting treatment again. Yes. So at the same time, it's also similar. I was studying me recently. Yeah. Xiaomi. So if you look at their products, almost every single one that they come out with a new one is fantastic. Correct, correct. <sighs> Problem is if you go and take out the even if you take out R and D cost and you assume everything is 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 growth R and D is so it's still about thirty types of things. I see. So it's a little bit it's not so easy to swallow. But their their model makes sense. But the thing is that China there's going to be a lot of other very good Chinese companies coming at the same time. Yeah. So that's one. Then the second one is that you know obviously the the U S have a lot of very interesting share structures. Okay. So like for example, Snap will just say you have no votes, nada. Nah. And then, you know, like Palantir one is very simple. As long as these three people agree, they're 51%, no matter mm. what stake they have. Mm. For me, that is almost a non-question because and because is, is your name Warren Buffett? Uh? You you can buy the whole company. Is it? No, <laughs> yeah. right? You you got how much? Huh? Yeah. 100K or Chong Meng. You go 100K, you cannot even go AGM. <laughs> so, end of the day, no matter which company you're going, the number of shares that you hold, your your it's likely just to be the same. It's just that it's just that the 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 presentation of your lack of rights is yes. different. Yes. You know, you go to an MNC, nobody hold control. CEO give himself fifty million salary. <laughs> what you want to do? <laughs> you want to kick out a board of directors? Yeah. Like you you dream lah. <laughs> so so for me, you're not. I don't have control anyway. So it's just a matter of is the management good enough? Mm. And I look at let's say Peter. I look at Carp. I look at Shyam. I look at the the way all these people talk. I was like. I, I literally uh, woke close up. Eye, uh, close eye. I, I literally woke up at four a.m. just to five a.m. just to watch the investor day presentation. You know, I, but I was impressed. Uh. I was impressed. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I, I the, the other day I watched the double click one. Uh. the moment I watched that, I was like, you know what, John? Maybe you should you should not buy slowly. Then the next day I woke up yesterday at around eight thirty. Not woke up around nine thirty p.m. The moment the market opens, so open, hand thumb to another <laughs> double the position first. Think later. Think later. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so that's Palantir. Uh, right now, not a profitable company. Let's talk about one that is very profitable, which is Apple. Now, Apple, I'm sure a lot of people can talk to me a lot about the software, the tech, da, 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 da. I'm not going to talk so much about that. Yeah. But we need to ask ourselves one very fundamental question. Is Tim Cook less innovative than Steve Jobs? Yes, to a certain extent, but he's a more of a disciplinarian who runs a very tight ship. That's how I see it. I agree with that, but I don't think he's less creative. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, why, 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 why do you think so? Now, you think about Apple. Uh, let's say when, Tim, when, 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 when Steve Jobs first came back, uh, what he did was, that, oh, he said, we cancel everything. We just do the, the first Mac computer. Yeah. The first Mac computer did not exactly turn the company around instantly. Nope. It's just a computer that's a bit nicer. Yeah. What turned the company around was the first iPod. Yeah. Was Steve Jobs this genius that say, iPod, ping. Yeah. No. What happened was that he had the idea for the iPod, but the technology wasn't there. Yes. So, a few years later, when Toshiba, if I'm not mistaken, Toshiba had their first mini hard drive. Yeah. He goes, we need that shit. And yeah. He goes and put it into the iPod, and then it goes crazy. Yeah. And the same thing with iPhone. iPhone, iPad, also, it was the same thing. So, Tim Cook was at the place uh, when chips went from 50 nm to like 5, to like, I'm not mistaken. 5, 5. Not yeah. 5. At this, time, he, at this time, 2014, it was maybe oh, yeah, like yeah, 10 no, nm. No, yeah, 10, 10, yeah. 10 and, not 10, uh, not 15 nm. 14, 14. 50 to 14 nm, yeah, yeah. okay? That's a huge jump. And in terms of storage space, uh, like he went from like, you can hold one gig. That was, no, no. He went from like, you can hold like 256 MB to now you, to at his time when he left or died, you can hold 64 gig. Yeah. And the chip yeah. space getting smaller. So when you're such huge advancement in technology, uh, you can be very creative in terms of what you want to do. Mm. So let's say now there's a reason why nobody come up with glasses with chips because the chips are not small enough. Yeah. Now, if you look at Apple, uh, my apprehension towards Apple products has always been expensive <laughs> and even grab try and screw you over i mean to be fair if you statistically if you go and order grab via app iphone versus let's say an android phone the iphone actually charges you that oh i didn't know that wow you can go and read up on that it's okay. actually slightly very slight but it's there because okay. apple what are you premium can, uh, yeah you can spend now but here's the thing if you look at let's say the iphone performance differences are uh, if you look at you don't look, at, let's say if you go go on a raw basis, uh, you say, I'm king of Antutu score, then you go and compare Antutu score only. 
Apple products is right now around 40% faster than all other products. Mm. And that's because Apple is the only one that can really integrate everything top to bottom, including software. Yeah. Now, then if you, but that's just Antutu is saying 40%. But if you go and look at the real world usage, uh, which you need to use Speedometer 2.0, uh, yeah. because Speedometer 2.0 is basically web applications that run on your phone. Yeah. Okay. The Apple products are all at the top and they are easily five times, four, four times better. The one that is, the only time an Android phone beats, which is the latest S10 beat, is when they beat an iPhone 8, released <laughs> in 2017, in terms of real world applications and usage. Mm. So you need to go back to 2017 in order for a 2021 phone to beat an Apple phone. My goodness. Now, mm. so that's just a phone. Now, obviously that is already a very, so suddenly you think about it from value perspective. Huh? I don't know how much, I can't forget, I remember, uh, uh, Samsung is, is like- 4K now, I mean the top of the line, you mean the, yeah, the, the, the flagship, la, the flagship. Yeah, the flagship it's about 4, is 4, 4, 5K. 4, 5K, yeah, and Apple is also 4, 5K, but it runs basically two to three times better. Yeah, why not? Suddenly, and Apple is actually cheap. Yeah, yeah. You see, now right. that is just the, the perspective for in terms of the phones. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the perspective uh, in terms of, let's say, the computer chips, uh, I'm not sure if you guys noticed this. Uh, like when the first M1 chip came out, I thought it was like, wow, this thing is amazing. Looks cool, yeah. It, because the thing is that it completely blew out of the water whatever Intel or, or whoever can do because yep. they went from CSIC to RSIC kind of formats Correct, yep. and then they created the Rosetta 2 translator. But it's also because they can, I don't know, some tech people may disagree. I'm also not a tech expert, but based on what I read, they say that they say it's because they can integrate literally everything into one chip, like the, like the RAM, etc. If you look at how you 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 assemble a computer now, it's like, oh, let's buy a hard drive, let, let's buy a motherboard, then stick the hard drive, stick the RAM, stick the stick the all these things are on a motherboard that is in different location, and the whole thing is like the size of like a very big A4 paper, and they're all with different links and stuff. That's right. And Apple one is like all of that is in this little box here, mm -hmm. and then it's all linked to the nanometer. It's like. The, the 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 RAM is next to the processor and literally you, you can't even fit your hair in the distance. Yeah. So instantly your performance is gonna go through the roof. Now for me, the thing that just blew my mind uh, was when I look at the new iMac. The new iMac uh, was so thin, uh, it's literally mm -hmm. just a slightly thicker iPad. Okay. And now they are planning to put this M1 chip and they put an M1 chip into an iPad. So I'm thinking to myself, uh, this is actually the same situation, not the same, it might be the same, it might be just a similar situation. It's very similar to the situation to when the Steve Jobs first found that Toshiba hard drive that could keep one gig of songs. Uh, so, so, so is, is it like an expansion of creativity moment for you? It's a complete, in, complete technological, technological jump. Let's say uh, people say, oh, what can you use Mac for? Okay, I can't use Mac to play games. Okay, they say that. Let's say that they use that question. And then to be fair, you can't use Mac on your Bloomberg. You can't use Bloomberg on Mac as well. Yeah. But games are going to go to the cloud. So what use do you have for Intel or Windows other than for data servers maybe? But why not you just use a Mac? You can play a game on a Mac if everything's on the cloud. Mm. And the Mac performance now is just blowing Intel completely out. Like even if you look at just raw RAM usage, uh, like you like RAM uh, on the, you think, oh, 60 GB on a Mac is not enough. Mm. But 60 GB on a Mac is equivalent to like 128 GB it, on, a, on, a, on a Windows. In, in Windows. It, it, it runs so much better. So. So when you go and it from that perspective, this is a, like a complete technological leap, you know. Yeah. Now, if you put this chip, it's M1 chip into an iPad. Uh, now, when they put it into a MacBook Air, the MacBook Air ran better than a 30 or 40,000 ringgit iMac. Or, no, not about than a 15 or 20,000 ringgit iMac. A MacBook Air that's 3,000 ran better than an iMac <laughs> and running like Final Cut Pro all this. Yeah. Imagine if you put this into a tablet. <laughs> oh my God. Can you imagine? Like <clears throat> if you ask yourself, uh, do you want to use a laptop or would you rather the laptop, like the only reason you're using a laptop is because you have to use a laptop. Mm -hmm. mm. Imagine if you can use a tablet instead of a laptop yeah. Yeah. and the tablet is just like that, but it's just as capable as that. And then you just need to bring along your maybe keyboard. A, a you can even use a fabric keyboard because you, now there are keyboards you can just roll the fabric. Yeah, yeah. And imagine if you want to play games, you can play games online. Why not you just go and link your controller to that? Who, which, which, why would you buy a laptop? Like, like why would you buy even a desktop? There's, there's no point. Mm. So I, I, I think like this M1, like this ability to, and now Apple has not really gone into integrating the, the, the graphics into that, even though it's doing well, but maybe it's not that relevant if you can play everything via, 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 you know, a, a cloud, et cetera. And maybe, you know, like this cloud thing can also expand to, let's say, because if you think about most people are uh, actually, you don't need much but an iPad. Mm. Like what do you do really? You know, the only reason you want a laptop maybe is because you play games or you play or, or you have like do like video work or this kind of stuff. So maybe if video work goes to the cloud is another issue, then maybe, you know, you can just have whatever. But even then, the, there's really not much of a better solution than 
a MacBook. A MacBook mm. is actually cheap now. Yeah. If you compare in terms of price performance. Yes. But obviously there's a, the, the main risk for this one is that now pe- the my, my my perspective was that people only use Android because they are they are broke. I use Android. <laughs> 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 no, you see, because there, there's a subset of people who use Android who yeah. are like, oh, it's because I can do all this, like I can root it and then I can do some wonderful stuff, blah, blah, blah. But like you're how many percent? Like, Very small. Uh. Like like and that was back then. Uh. Now also people lazy, I yeah. think, in my opinion. Like the percentage has dropped a lot. Yeah. So uh if you look at it from that perspective, I'm just thinking to myself, who 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 can't use a better product than than that? So for me, that that and now if the if the gap just be and if you look at just like the normal computer chip, like just use like the normal like Samsung Snapdragon versus the the no, the Oxynos or the Snapdragon or Kirin versus the A12. Uh, yeah. This is like where it's similar. Uh, everything is integrated into the chip itself. Uh, but there's already a 50% gap. Uh. Mm. What are what are we gonna look at in terms of the gap for desktop? And this gap on the chips for the mobile is already increasing. You yes, know? yes. So I I I I, I don't know if we would use if and if you I don't know this is my perspective is that uh if you look at the OS usage for Mac it's been going up uh the data I see is going up but some people tell me that data is wrong I don't know maybe you guys need to check whoever is reading listening to this mm. but um so yeah so 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 looking at it from that perspective I'm just thinking to myself like this is a complete shift like it 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 changes things completely and and if you can somehow get this chip smaller and smaller and then you know and your performance gap start to get bigger and bigger you know whoever is actually going to solve this vr problem because now vr is mainly because it's very big bulky, and bulky and all yeah. that kind of stuff it's going to be apple like it, it yeah and even if you look at let's say car chips or whatever like you know i mean i don't want to talk about self-driving cars because i just don't think self-driving cars will really be a reality mm-hmm. for a long time but um but yeah in terms of like apple products it's like it's going to be best in class. It's going to replace basically all consumer products mm. over time. But mm. of course, the thing is that I know that there are some very rich people who are not poor, but they just don't like to use Apple products. They actually used Apple before and then they went to Android and then they like Android. Mm. And these people are worth like millions to hundred millions to even some 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 very rich, very very rich people use use Android. Mm. So I'm not sure why. They right. say that they're just not used to it or they or they don't find it good. But no, I think they maybe they don't want to get stuck in the ecosystem. That is probably one reason. Uh. Yeah, I think like there was a story of Steve Jobs not even wanting their own kids to, to yeah. have an iPhone or smartphone yeah. or something. Like that. I, I, wasn't it that one just to be like good parenting? So you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, that that probably. I I was um I had my first tablet as an iPad too. I loved mm. it, but the reason why I got out was because one uh, I hated that I could not transfer PDF files to read exactly. Okay, to read inside, uh, you needed iTunes. Second thing is, uh, I didn't went cheap. I used to buy cheap phones like you, you know, mm. Penny Pinch and all that. What I found was that the found the phones always outgrew me. I, I always outgrew the phones because mm. the phones could not last. Then I went to buy a flagship. This is a Huawei. This is a flag. This is about three, four years already. Mm. But then I realized, in terms of once you get used into the Apple ecosystem, it's very hard for you to get out already because you talk about price value, right? Apple is not expensive. Yeah. You look at it from a price point, it's very expensive. But when you look at performance wise or whatever, right, it's actually not that expensive. Yeah. 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 And if I look at let's say let's say we're using the ecosystem argument, maybe, maybe. But yeah. the thing is that that was the same reason as well. I hated the fact I couldn't move files directly into my phone. Exactly. <laughs> but that was also like five, six years ago. Yeah. These days I actually can't remember the last time I connected my phone to my desktop. Mm. Because I, today you can, you know, cloud cloud it and you yeah. can yeah. And yeah. if I want to send file, I'll just do it via WhatsApp and then just download. Exactly. It. <laughs> same, yeah. same. Or, yeah. or you can just, you know, you you cloud it and then you just download it from there anyways. Like when like so given those style of things, I actually don't and that was why like I actually planned to buy an iPhone. I don't oh god, I can't believe I'm gonna spend money on that. <laughs> but I mean I suppose I can buy the stock before looking at iPhone first, but the stock is maybe not so cheap. But you know, it's like it's not it's not Oh, uh, so it's a declaration you do not own the stock. Currently. I don't own the stock, okay. the stock yeah, because I was only thinking and talking this through like one, two days ago. I see. Mm. I see. So I, I'm sure the rest of the part they do it very well. So um I, but I need to study, but you know, my, always my confidence level is not so high. Da, 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 so I, I'm probably, if I buy, I'll probably buy like maybe three, five percent first. I understand. You, you see how it goes. Yeah. But yeah, it, from that perspective, it's like, I, yeah, I, I just don't see people leaving Apple. Mm. All right. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, well, we've talked a lot about, I think we, we do need to have lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's coming so, to three hours. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I, I just want to, and, and, and you know, we, we were talking, actually, I wanted to ask you about, uh, we want to talk about crypto. Maybe we can talk about the next time. 
I know you're a big fan of Lee Kuan Yew. I think that's something that we uh, I yeah. wanted to talk yeah, about. But it's a, a but fan. yeah, I'm a big fan as well. But yeah. the, you know, lunch. Mm. Um, but just the last question is, you know, we've been talking a lot about the micro stuff, right? Which is the yeah. individual stock, which is for me the most important thing. But let's take a step back and you know look at the big picture globally, right? Where do you see the opportunities going forward, or do you have any thoughts that you want to share with us about what do you think is going to happen? Things that you don't like, things that you like about the global economy. Um. So let's say you're a normal investor and you think to yourself, let's do index investing. Let's say, okay. So we we start like is index index investing a good idea? I think index investing is one of those things where if too much money goes into it, it has its own distortion. Yes. Yeah. So for example, value stocks, if they're not into it, then you're obviously buying overpriced stocks a lot. I don't want to tell talk about whether Tesla is expensive or not, lah, but <laughs> um but so there's a distortion there. And so over time, this distortion will make your returns less slightly less over time. People are saying that, but obviously the, the stock price are still going up. But you know, it's it it I think logically over the next over the next 50 years, if let's say money into indexes keep going up, the return should lower a little bit. Diminish, uh, yeah. Yeah. So now the question for me now is just, but there's a there's a difference of buying index in, let's say the US, this is buying index in another country where there's a lot of positive dynamics going for it, but it has not happened yet. Mm. So now let's say one com- one place, I'm not sure if you guys have been studying, if you guys haven't, you guys can just go and look up on Ray Dalio and then what he's been writing. Yeah, on, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have. On, yeah. like, on like movement of just like world history and how it moves. If you look at the the five or eight different factors in which you how you determine the superpower and how they flow, you know education, technology, all of that. Yeah. China have already exceeded US. The US is still there because of their military and their reserve currency. But yeah. the, like, but if you look at history, these are the last two things to go always. The last bastions, uh. Yeah. So it's it's already there. Now if you look at China, um, let's just give you an example. Uh. Let's just look at a highway company. Yeah. Uh. Mm. Anhui Expressways, uh, is a net cash highway company selling at five times earnings. <laughs> it is not possible to find this kind of valuation in any market in the world. Mm. Now, why is this the case? It's very simple. In China, number one, capital inflows are not fully opened up yet. Mm. And that's just the nature of things. If you look at any economy or any or any nation that start to grow over time, they don't wake up in the morning and then be like, let's open Choi Sam and ask everybody to come in. <laughs> yeah. Because you you because it it it's it a makes sense. Process. It's a benef- it, it's beneficial for you to close up at the start. Yes. And then you slowly you you control the internal because you want to 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 control your own economy and stuff. Okay. Now, but over time, every single world power eventually opens up. Why? Because it's the profitable thing to do. Yeah. It's you prof- attract attract capitalism in. Yeah, it, it's a profitable thing to do. So they always <coughs> open up in the end. So now the China economy, the, the China markets, number one, capital inflows are limited. That's one. Number two, corporate governance there is a little bit weak. Yeah. Or some would say very weak. But the thing is that, why is it weak? Because that's the nature of all markets that are new. Yeah. Okay. And the Chinese government is not like making one saying, oh, you know what? Never mind, let's stay weak forever. Lah. No, ma. They are like, we need to solve this thing. Last time, ma, Chinese people, Chinese companies can screw over Americans. Yeah. And the China government will do nothing about it. Yes. Now this is not the case. They are They are actually like, Taking luck in and just smacking them on the buttocks and then be like, you you you, you, you better buck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And corporate governance, you know, like last time you look at the 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 milk scandal, yeah. those guys are sentenced to death. Yes. You try and see that happen in the US, US. And see, it doesn't work. So they you these, just get a slap on the wrist and you just yeah. move on. Yeah. And even like you no know, corruption, like the Huarong Bang guy also sentenced to death. You know, like yeah. these people are very serious about corporate governance. It's going to improve over time. Yeah. And the third one is that in the because and also the third one is that in terms of retail for China, this because people also don't trust their own people don't trust the the stock market. Mm. So in terms of retail participants, it's very low, other than in the top five stocks, etc. Mm. So now if you ask me, uh, and then obviously in China there's also this dynamic that you need to be aware of, which is the CCP is you must never threaten the CCP. Mm. Yeah. So now there's people like to say to me, oh John, regulation in China very random one. Suddenly government can wake up and try and screw over your company. Yeah. Maybe if your name is Tencent or Alibaba, where you're trying to do everything yeah. and hold so much power, if you are doing like fruit juice in China, you think the government gonna try and or regulate soya sauce. you? Yeah, it's like or aircon. Yeah, exactly. You look at you look at Xiaomi. You think government trying to regulate Xiaomi or my dear? No, right? Yeah. But you look at their capabilities going up every year. And even now, if you look at medical devices, a lot of these companies now the some of the biggest medical devices manufacturers are in, in China. China. Mm. And if you look, yeah, so. So when I, so if and if and the thing about this is gonna sound slightly racist, but if you go to like let's say fifty years ago, uh, you go to all these difficult competitions, uh, 
let's say violin uh, piano uh, all these are more one yeah, more, yeah. more yeah. playing in piano now you go to those competitions all asian all chinese Correct. yeah this you need to know uh, these people are uh, the these people just are just in general overachievers and number two they really love money <laughs> we all know the ronnie chang bit you know kong si fa tai, i hope you get rich yeah <laughs> Now, yeah. if you have this group of people who really, really like money and want to grow money and want to make more money in one country, it's going to do very well. You look even in Malaysia buying property, you want to buy the place where nobody want to get rich. Right? No, right? you want to go to a place all hot. Right? All this, because when people want to get rich and they become rich, they spend money and then everybody become rich together. It's like trying to buy property in Kelantan, Kelantan or Putrajaya versus trying to buy in Puchong. Yeah, there's a huge difference. There's yeah. next, next to Cyber Jaya, but Cyber Jaya never hot one actually. Yeah, and you need the money to be there. You yes. cannot physically force the the like people try and force Putra Jaya on on everyone. Yeah, my parents almost bought a house in Putra Jaya. Thank God we didn't. Yeah. But you just can't force people to go. You can just can't. You just can't force development on a place where the people don't want to make money. Correct. Or where where the people don't want to do business. Yeah. So you go to China, the whole world down there is trying to fight and do business, etc. So for me, I would say this: if you have a choice. And you let's say you're really looking long term, I would put a significant weight into indexes in China. Because mm. over time, as the economy opens up, I think 20, 30 years from now, you're gonna look at a very big difference in valuations really. Mm. But obviously, if you have the time, like me, let's say where you want to work full time and, and study stocks. My plan now is to sit down. There's about 10,000 listed companies <laughs> in Hong Kong and another fourteen, 10, another seven thousand in Shanghai. A, a shares on it. A, a, share. a shares and H shares. So I'm yeah. not sure. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out which, yeah. which, but I'm probably start with the Hong Kong one. Sit down and go A to Z. Yeah, read Just sit down. You It will only take you about... Two months, three months. Not two months. Uh. Three months is if it's a Malaysia. Malaysia 1000, you can yeah, go. Yeah, I three, think three, this one probably a year, man. A year plus. Because yeah. like a lot of the shares, you can just one look and then you can <coughs> don't look anymore because the whole one cannot. Yeah. But you just need to find, uh, like again, wonderful economics, wonderful... Man I mean, almost 20,000 shares. I'm sure you can somehow find it. Yeah. Wonderful Kong Kong yeah. Kong Kong. Yeah. 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 Wonderful economics, wonderful management. And better yet, if the manager is only like forty years old, uh, and then still oh, about yeah, yeah. four. Hey, how how old is the high high tila boss? Uh? I think sixty. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, quite okay, old, so yeah. it's quite old. Right? It's quite old. It's a big bald. He's balding. Really. <laughs> yeah, but even high tila, you, you look at how they run their business. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. completely different. Right? Amazing man. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So so yeah, if if let's say somebody here, you really enjoy investing. For me, I I always enjoy it because it's it's just studying about. Correct. It's study of life, like what you said. Yeah, but of course, for some people, they'll be like, oh, you know, it's a little bit what I I just ask them, you know, you like shopping or not? Yeah. You go into LV, you feel very happy, right? You find a, L a cheap LV, you feel happy, right? <laughs> Think about, go and take your LV and post it on the on the stock, you know? It's yeah. like, like you can buy this company now, this really wonderful one for like 50% off. It's like, wow, you, yeah. you, you, you can what inside there, you yeah. know? So so I would say that, yeah, it if it might make sense, I, I'm personally planning to go on China to go to, to, for, to for maybe one, two months now yeah. that I might, I, I'm leaving like corporate jobs. Yeah. So, Plan going there for one two months. Just go there and sit down and just walk around and, and just see Un and understand the yeah. business. Yeah. So, but yeah, it it if I if I were to say you don't know where to put your money, etc. Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe buy some US, buy some this. There's still a lot of positive dynamics US wise because as if interest rates are so low, money is going to flow from bonds and MMF into stocks. Correct. So there's still a lot of positive momentum there. But if you're looking at in terms of like you want to think about 30, 40 years, which makes sense because you you this saving that for me are uh, savings you don't you you don't ever touch it. Yeah. Yeah. So you you hold these savings because you for your next 30, 40 years, man, because you're accounting for the next 30, 40 years. Man. So you might just might as well just buy some Chinese index. Mm. Yeah, of course. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so just buy some Chinese index and then just 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 sit there and wait. Over time, the valuations will all expand, da, 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 and then you you'll do well. Man. Great. Okay, so uh last question, right? <laughs> so you talk about China and I want to get your idea because you are you're talking about index for those people who don't spend time. So for you who spend time, right? What are some of the things that have picked your interest in terms of uh areas that you or think that's like opportunities or themes uh. because i know for example one of the right now uh, china is transitioning from manufacturing to a more service oriented uh uh country and part, partly because cost of mm. their, their labor is not cheap anymore so they yeah. can't be manufacturing so it's going to be a challenge because mm. their services if you look at it in terms of the consumption right is quite low actually compared mm. to developed nations so my from my perspective, I think the opportunity is in the service industry. So what are what are your some of your thoughts on the opportunities? We can go at it from sector to sector and then obviously like you know, if you go to let's say you go and look in the data sector and say there's gonna be a lot of positive dynamics and stuff. Um I would say I don't know because mm. I have not because you, you cannot just go and say 
not you cannot like, I mean you you can go and take the perspective but you need to understand like after I read all 1000 companies in Bursa I understood the history of Malaysian economy how it really flows mm, and very then good. you need to know each industry how it flows <coughs> as well and you need to so so and that's just a big picture but the second picture is like what are some of the possibilities that you have so if you look at medical or let's say services, all this, I'm sure there's a lot of people looking there already. Now, considering how much there is left to grow, possibly there, there's probably still something to buy there. But I think the ones where you want to look for is like the industries that people are not really looking at. Like last time, I, for example, in 2018, I was quite enamored by Chinese pork companies. Chinese pork companies, okay. Mm. Yeah, Be- because yeah. because of the Tyson food deal, right? Not just the not so much the Tyson food deal, but because back then the pork companies were all very cheap. Uh-huh. That's one. And number two. If you look at the meat consumption in China, it's actually way lower than the US. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. The consumerism is actually increasing. Yeah, yeah. But the difference, obviously, is these pork companies when they were selling back then was like five times earnings. Mm. It might be difficult to find a services industry that's selling five times. But of course, again, the 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 the, the perspective is always this: if I were to 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 start again from new, I would make sure. I think people need to understand the different kind of business models they are. Like, oh yeah. Like let's say commodity business, you know, it's not like you can't invest in them. You can, you know, if you invest in United Plantations back when it was young, and they get twenty eight metric ton per hectare versus the average of twenty metric ton per hectare from yeah. palm oil. Yeah. You're gonna do very well. Correct. So so it's you commodities you want to look for the best, then the others you want to look for good industry dynamics, etc. So it's too hard for me to say which industry it comes from. That's why I I mean I was talking with a fund manager and then we were thinking like I want to study this industry. How, how I want to study this market, how should I do it? He says, mm. you know, pick your industries and go into those. Now that he's a very smart guy, so maybe there's a good thesis for that. Mm. But I would say that if you have the time, uh you can maybe start from that perspective first, but do not take the shortcut you want to read A to Z. Yeah. Like the farm manager I was talking to, he understands his tech. He says he understands how the transistors work. Where is N gate, this gate, and then how the <laughs> logic works. Then only he says, he says it's just an additional few percent, but he but he thinks, well, like, especially for these extremely complex industries. Yes. This, I mean, if this is a textile company, you don't really need to know how many weaves each. Like, you just need to know, to know the big picture. But when it's an extremely complex industry, you need to know what are the variables that you won't know, you see. It's like this M1 chip. It could really just end end things for like Intel or or, or or whoever. Exactly. Exactly. You know, because like what you said, it's a 1% edge. Mm. But most people would not be bothered or have the discipline. I mean, you know, I was, MG knows this very well. When we when I was studying me, right? Mm. I spent two months just reading about packaging technology. Not about the company, you know. Just about wafer packaging. And yeah. that... And I'm an, I'm a trained electrical <coughs> engineer. Can you imagine? Uh. <laughs> Just for me, and and I think I think what you said is really really true. That you, in essence, if we distill it to the listeners, is really about knowing your age, uh, knowing that business really really well. Uh. If you don't, yeah. then it's gonna be tough. Uh. By the way, did you talk? Do you in your semicon speech that you're selling? Do you have the <laughs> MI all that things that you learn about MI in there? Uh we can we can side chat later. Because <laughs> 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 I'm like I'm gonna spend hundred and forty ringgit or whatever. <laughs> it better be worth it. <laughs> All right, uh, Jonathan. Um, you know, it's been one of the most productive podcasts out yeah, there, and um, you know, all of them are great. But mm. I think, I think just because of the length, it's I think people are gonna get a lot of value. And uh, before we end, right, where can people find you? Yeah, where can people find uh, you? Uh, you can go choivocapital.com. C H I C H O I C H O Yep. C A P I T A L dot com, and then my email is there. I yeah. also have a Telegram group, but to be frank, I'm not really promoting it okay yeah and to be and uh, and you know i at least for the future i think i would write about malaysian stocks a little bit less because malaysia there's regulations well for them and it's not profitable for me anyway understand right. understand yeah. we'll put the links in the yeah. comment section below so but yeah you can reach me there and then you know we can I, I'm, I'm i'm always hap- happy to talk to people because you know again my, my spending habits is completely different it's very hard for me to find new stocks because i don't spend money using. So i need people <laughs> who spend money <laughs> all right yeah. so uh yeah thank you so much for being on the podcast and um i think there will be a part two yeah probably part very, three. very likely very likely yeah and uh, yeah two. guys i i'm very sure you got a lot of value out of this podcast so stay tuned for the next one and i uh, hope to see join them back in the podcast sometime soon and uh goodbye everybody yep thank yep. you thank you <laughs>